All right, uh, we have reconvened, and I'd like to make the following closed session announcement. By a five to zero vote, the City Council authorized the City Attorney's Office to initiate litigation in one matter. The name of the defendants and details are not subject to disclosure at this time. Once litigation is filed, this information will be disclosed to any person upon inquiry. With that, I will go ahead and adjourn the special meeting at 6.05 p.m. And I would like to call to order the Elk Grove City Council regular meeting. Today is Wednesday, February the 22nd, 2023, and it is 6.05 p.m. Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. This meeting of the Elk Grove City Council will be replayed on Metro Cable Channel 14 on Friday, February 24th at 1 p.m. and Wednesday, March 1st at 9 a.m. It is being closed captioned. It will be webcast at sacmetrocable.tv. City Council meeting videos are also archived on the city's website at elkgrovecity.org. For members of the participating audience who may have personal electronic devices, please place them on silent mode during the meeting or on mute when you are not speaking. This, uh, the Elk Grove City Council welcomes, appreciates, and encourages participation in the City Council meeting. City Council requests that you limit your presentation to three minutes per person so that all present will have time to participate. And City Council reserves the right to reasonably limit the total time for public comment on any particular noticed agenda item as it may deem necessary. Pursuant to resolution number 2010-24, no individual speaker concerning public comment may address the City Council for more than three minutes. If you wish to address the Council during the meeting, please complete the blue speaker cards. Those can be found at the back of the room, or we have them as well up here at the front counter at the front desk, and provide them to Assistant City Clerk Brenda Haggard prior to consideration of the agenda item. Thank you, Mayor. With that, I will move over to our roll call. And starting for the roll call, I will start with Council Member Robles. Present. Council Member Brewer. Present. Council Member Suen. Here. Vice Mayor Spees. Present. And Mayor Singh Allen. Here. All are present. All right, thank you. Um, next up is our Pledge of Allegiance, and I'd like to invite up Jesse Bermudez, the new District Director for Assembly Member Wynn, to lead us in the pledge this evening. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, at this time, um, I would like for us to observe a brief moment of silence. Thank you. Next up, we have the approval of the agenda. May I get a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Next item, closed session. Clerk. There are no closed session items on the regular agenda, which will advance us to section four, our presentations and announcements. And our loan item tonight under presentations is item 4.1, a proclamation in recognition of Black History Month. All right, wonderful. Um, do we have uh, Margaret Fortune here with us? Wonderful, we'd like to call you up to the podium. And bring <coughs> your friends and family, excellent. All right, uh, proclamation for Black History Month, February 2023. Whereas in 1926, Carter G. Woodson laid the foundation for Black History Month to dedicate an observance of the contributions, accomplishments, and achievements of black Americans, a history that previously had all but been erased from national history and underrepresented in important policy decisions. And whereas since 1976, February has been designated Black History Month as a time in which especially memorable events are recognized and celebrated honoring and affirming the importance of African-American history and culture as an essential element to the foundation of American history. And whereas black Americans for generations have courageously led the pursuit of justice and equality to overcome the past injustices, yet still moving forward, taking on the challenges to advance reforms and break down barriers as we strive as a community to live by the principle that all people are created equal. And whereas the city of Elk Grove recognizes the late Dr. Rex Fortune as a strong visionary who used his extensive experience and expertise 
as a school superintendent for over 20 years, and he founded the Fortune School of Education in 1989 to prepare a more diverse group of teaching candidates into public schools in California, and Dr. Margaret Fortune, president and CEO, for her dedication and contributions to the Elk Grove community and the Sacramento region. And whereas after his daughter, Dr. Margaret Fortune joined Fortune School of Education as its president and CEO in 2008, the organization expanded to include a system of tuition-free college preparatory and public charter schools with combined enrollment of over 2,000 2, grades pre-K through 12, including four schools in Elk Grove, and whereas doctors Rex and Margaret Fortune have, through deep-rooted community service, tirelessly work to bridge the African-American educational achievement gap by preparing scholars for college starting in preschool. Now therefore be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Elk Grove hereby affirms and proclaims February 2023 as Black History Month in the City of Elk Grove. And we thank Rex and Margaret Fortune for their commitment to the community. Thank you so much for all that you've done. Please. Thank you so much, Mayor Singh Allen. I'm joined here but with my mother, the original Margaret Fortune, Mrs. Margaret <laughs> Fortune. And I wanna thank you all so much, um, our friends on the, on the council and the city of Elk Grove for being so welcoming to Fortune. I wanna thank the mayor for visiting our schools. Um, and right here in this uh, council room, uh, the Planning Commission for approving our facilities that we have built in Elk Grove. Um, oftentimes, African Americans don't have the opportunity to see the plans for the city before the city is built. But the city of Elk Grove, just like I'm sure you did with other business leaders and educational leaders, made room for us at the table and showed us the development of the city which put us in a position to plan. And so we built a $27 million facility, uh, the Rex and Margaret Fortune Education Complex, um, and we're gonna head there after this to go to our uh, playoff game for basketball because our boys and girls are league champions. Wow. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be champions in this city, and thank you for recognizing my late father, Dr. Rex Fortune, I'm proud to be a third generation educator, and I learned at his feet and at my mother's feet. Oh. Oh. And he um, was a real trailblazer. He was also kind as he did his work. He was thoughtful as he did his work. Mm -hmm. And what we are known for as a family is for investigating and finding the best practices in educating African-American students to a level of ex excellence, shining a light on that work, and replicating that work. So we are proud to be members of the Elk Grove community. Thank you for embracing us, and thanking, thank you for giving us the opportunity to represent African-Americans in Black History Month. Thank you, yes. wow. Um, really want to thank you again for all of your contributions. We extend our condolences to you and your family for the great loss. It's a, it's a loss that is felt throughout the educational community. And as a former school board trustee and ardent advocate for public education, I know the tremendous role that you play and the, uh, and the Fortune schools play in closing that achievement gap. I've had the pleasure of visiting your school and seeing these dynamic young scholars come every day with great pride, great pride and eagerness to achieve, to dream big. And you've instilled such a beautiful culture in the schools. So I encourage all of my colleagues to go and visit the schools if you haven't already, and you will be transformed. You will, it, there's just amazing work that's taking place there. And uh, looking forward to continuing our conversations as we bring additional bus routes to serve the students at the school as well in working with SACRT to offer those additional services um, the best that we can. So congratulations and thank you so much for all that you do in our community. Thank you. Thank Quick you. question, is Coach Swafford still coaching basketball? 
He is. He it, is. That explains uh, why the the championships then. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> Coach Swafford is at the Rex and Margaret Fortune Pavilion as we speak. That's I'm so, sure giving a, a pep talk to the team. So if a, they win tonight, then we're on to the Golden One Center on uh, awesome. Saturday at 12 p.m. So it's former SAC High coach definitely beat Hiram Johnson. We lost. I played against him, but he's a, <laughs> an amazing coach. So thank you. Thank you. Go yeah. Panthers. <laughs> we have a proclamation we'll present to you down there. Any other colleagues want to say anything before we go down? No. I just want to commend the Fortune family for all the, the contributions you're making uh, on the educational front. And thank you for your presence mm -hmm. here in our city. So we, we really appreciate you, know, you, you being here. And we look forward to seeing the kids out in the community as well. Thank, thank you. you. And, I, and I'm also very appreciative of the work that you and your family has done in Elk Grove and invested in Elk Grove over the years. I know several times as uh, your classes have that end of year session and your partnership with the police department and holding yes. activities and needing facilities or fields for kickball and stuff like that, I was more than happy to help and we'll continue to be happy to help you in that, res in that regard. And really thank you for investing and being a part of Elk Grove. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come down there. Thank you. 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 All right, next up we have our public comment. And I see, oh, one person signed up, Jesse Bermudez. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Jesse Bermudez. I'm the District Director for Assembly Member Stephanie Wynn. Uh, this is Stephanie Fan and Lynn Yi, and we are part of the district office team that is now open here in Elk Grove. Uh, the address is 9250 Laguna Springs Drive, which is just down the street from here. Uh, we're excited to serve Elk Grove and continue working with the council um, on issues in Elk Grove. So we just want to introduce ourselves and let you know that we're here to help and to support. All right. Well, thank you and welcome. And I'm looking forward to a partnership with the district office and Assembly Member Wynn's office. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great thank evening. You. Thank you. All right. Next up, item six, our city manager's report. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the City Council. A few items to report on this evening. Uh, the City and the CSD continue to, uh, to work together to host various community conversations around the expenditure of Measure E funds. We've hosted two meetings so far, one on uh, pu public safety, police and fire representatives were there and had great conversations with the community. Um, and then we had another one last week on economic development. And we have two more coming up. Uh, next week on Monday and Tuesday. On Monday evening, we have addressing homelessness, and then Tuesday we have maintaining streets and parks. So we invite all members of the community to come on out and participate, and staff will be there to share thoughts and ideas of how those funds might be best put to use within our community, but we're also engaging and trying to gather information about what the community would like to see um, with those funds. So please take advantage of that opportunity coming up next week on February 27th and 28th. 
Um, just as a reminder as well, the Oversight Committee app, uh, nomination period is open right now. Those applications are accepted through March 1st. So um, we expect to receive a number of applications through that process. Uh, great news, we continue to make a good progress on the Camera Road Extension Project. There's gonna be an opportunity coming up uh, in the near future to have the public have an opportunity to review and comment on the environmental assessment. Uh, for the Camera Road project beginning this next Monday, February 27th. The project proposes to improve Camera Road between I-5 Hood-Franklin Road Interchange and the State Right 99 Camera Road, Grand Lincoln Road Interchange. A copy will be available on the city's website. Notice availability should be complete by the end of the calendar year. There's an internet safety workshop coming up hosted by our police department. Keeping kids safe online as in an era of apps and social media platforms is challenging. To help parents navigate the internet, the police department will host a free internet safety workshop tomorrow night, um, February 23rd at 6 p.m. at District 56. No registration is required. Come and learn tips and tools to keep your children safe. Uh, grant applications for the event sponsorship grant will close this Friday, February 24th. Uh, more information can be found on the city's website. Uh, the Arts Commission will be hosting an event, the Blues Review, which will be at District 56 on Sunday, March 12th. The event will feature local performers playing classic blues tunes. Tickets are $10 per person, available through Eventbrite. Details are also available on the city's Facebook page. Um, a couple other reminders, the Business Recovery Center is open. Um, the U.S. Small Business Administration um, is open in Old Town at 9072 Elk Grove Boulevard, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. The center, center can offer a wide range of services for those businesses impacted by the severe storms earlier this year. Uh, also, nominations for the 2023 Mayor's Volunteer Awards are being accepted now through March 10th in several different categories. Recognize one of the city's humble heroes by submitting a nomination online on the city's website. And finally, um, AARP is offering tax preparation assistance for seniors by appointment on Tuesdays and Thursdays at the Elk Grove Aquatic Center and at the Senior Center inside the Center District 56 on Fridays through April 15th. Book a tax appointment online at ca41taxa.org or by calling 916-498-1000. And that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions that the council might have. All right, thank you for that update. Any questions or comments from colleagues? All right, seeing none, thank you, sir. We will move on to our next item, our consent calendars, calendar items. I will go ahead and open up the public comment opportunity. Seeing nobody signed up to speak, I'll close the public comment opportunity and move, look for a motion. Move consent. <coughs> Excuse me, move consent. Yes. Do I have a second? Second. second. One of them. <laughs> All those in uh, favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. All right, next item, 8.1. And 8.1 is a public hearing to consider resolution adopting the Laguna Creek Interregional Trail Master Plan. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, Carrie Whitlock, Strategic Planning and Innovation Program Manager. Um, I'm also joined by Kaylee Lyons, who's our Senior Transportation Planner. Um, and once this is adopted by council, we'll be taking on implementation with us. So we are here tonight to talk about the Laguna Creek Interregional Trail Master Plan. Um, this plan provides a conceptual multimodal planning foundation for Elk Grove. Um, the plan was funded through a Caltrans Sustainable Transportation Grant and was done in consultation with the City of Sacramento as the Laguna Creek Trail includes not just Elk Grove but continues into South Sac. Um, the partners that helped us in developing this plan were GHD and Civic Thread. When completed, the trail will stretch the width of Elk Grove. It will provide 10.3 miles of Class 1 facilities and connect with the uh, Franklin Light Rail Station in the city of Sacramento. There are sections of the trail that are already built or are in progress through CIP or development projects. Um, this plan focuses on those sections in orange here that are proposed in addition to providing recommendations that would make a unified, unified, fully connected trail once all sections are completed. The goals of the plan include um, multimodal access to a variety of locations in Elk Grove and South Sacramento, 
increasing affordable and accessible alternatives to driving, and helping meet our active transportation goals that were outlined in the bike ped, um, Bicycle Pedestrian Trails Master Plan that was adopted in 2021. Specifically, those goals related to increasing bicycle and walking, um, improving connectivity and accessibility, and supporting a culture where walking and biking are safe and convenient options. The plan document itself includes a number of components outlined here. The document has been reviewed by both the Trails Committee and the Disability Advisory Committee, and their comments were incorporated with public comments received in October and November. The plan was presented at a January meeting of the Planning Commission who recommended it to City Council for approval. The existing conditions section describes the existing and planned multimodal transportation, existing and planned land uses, transportation behaviors, and conditions related to safety. It explores both rural and urban with connections to neighborhood and community parks, um, looks at schools, retail recreational facilities, community centers within a quarter mile of the trail. It considers transit routes, stops, and transfer points located near the trail area. It provides an overview of population data, um, looking at age, um, household vehicle ownership, income statistics, provides a detailed overview of the existing and planned seg segments, and then because um, safety continues to be one of the things raised both when we did outreach on this and also with our bicycle, pedestrian, and trail master plan, um, this chapter also um, does an overview of existing safety data and transportation behaviors. Outreach and engagement um, with both the Elk Grove and the South Sacramento communities was an essential part of the plan development. We had a community advisory group that was formed. It consisted of 12 diverse um, community members. They were selected through an application process and were provided stipends to help co-lead workshops. Um, we had an online tool that included an interactive map. It included a survey, a participatory budgeting tool. It was used to gather a lot of feedback from the community. We also did a lot of supporting and in-person events. We did canvassing in neighborhoods adjacent to the trail. There was a video promotion done, yard signs placed along the trail in both Elk Grove and the South Sacramento section to promote input. We had pop-up events at the North Laguna Creek Park to collect feedback from users of the trail. We had um, engagements at the neighborhood market in Elk Grove. Um, we also participated in various different events, the Family Wellness Festival and the South Sacramento Festival that was held at North Laguna Creek Park to help try and get more input from the communities. So there are six segments um, that are as yet to be completed or their areas for proposed upgrades. Um, the upgrades are primarily in the city of Sacramento, segments one and two. The other four segments of yet to be completed sections are in Elk Grove and would connect short existing trail segments to form a more completed trail system. The segments within the city of Sacramento have been reviewed and shared with them, and they plan to use this information for potential upgrades to those facilities um, in the future. So I'm gonna quickly look at the different segments. Feel free if you have any questions as I go through. Segment one, as I mentioned, is in the city of South Sacramento, is in the city of Sacramento. It would include a new class one trail segment on the south side of Kasumnas River, going from um, the Franklin Light Rail Station to Franklin Boulevard. It is within the regional sand buffer land and we did coordinate with them and they're not opposed to this um, idea going forward. Um, it also includes a section along Franklin Boulevard. There are two options proposed there. We already have a class four facility there, but these options would improve safety along that corridor. Um, we also have segment two is in the city of Sacramento as well. It's along Center Parkway. This would include um, taking an existing sidewalk and widening it to be a class one facility along the west side of Center Parkway. Segment three is then within the city of Elk Grove. It goes from Lewis Stein Road um, to what will be the overcrossing pedestrian and bicycle overcrossing at State Route 99, um, following along the, the Laguna Creek. Section four also in Elk Grove um, completes, so it, it connects to existing segments of trail 
There's an existing section that ends right um, to the west of Waterman where there is a parking lot and it would continue that trail um, as an undercrossing of Waterman Road up along the south side of Bond to Sierra River Drive where is, there is a an existing section of trail. Section five also connecting um, small existing sections of trail to the east of Bradshaw Road along the south side of Bond um, to uh, just to the west of Kapalua Lane. And then finally, section six um, is the last segment from Van Ruten Lane along the south side again of Bond Road and would connect at Grant Line where there will be a class one trail the length of Grant Line Road as well. So included in the document as well is sort of an a la carte menu of ideas for infrastructure updates to be added along the entire length of the trail to ensure it is inclusive and accessible. This includes things like wayfinding and interpretive signage to make sure people understand and know where they are on the trail and what amenities are in the vicinity, benches and picnic tables to allow for users to rest, drinking fountains, bicycle repair stations, public art, restrooms, trash, and um, dog waste stations. The document provides a listing of potential funding sources um, at the local, state, and federal level to help um, support the completion of the trail as well. And then in terms of environmental review, the project is exempt pursuant to state CEQA guidelines section 15262. Um, the implementation of any of these specific segments, designs that are identified in the plan would include specific follow-up, specific CEQA analysis and approval before the commitment of funds um, for any construction. And then finally, staff recommends that City Council adopt a resolution finding no further environmental review is needed and adopting the Laguna Creek in a regional trail master plan. And with that, um, we are available for any questions. All right, thank you, Ms. Whitlock, for your presentation. At this time, I will declare the public hearing is now open and open up the public comment opportunity. I see Ms. Sharon Anderson is here, uh, signed up to speak. Hello, Mayor Singh Allen and Hello. council members and Vice Mayor Kevin Spees. That's kind of a new one for me because I'm used to Darren. <laughs> so um, thanks for letting me speak on this item. Um, I was part of the CAG, the Citizens Advisory Group. Um, got to know Carrie very well. She's an incredible staff person and also a really good um, listener to input. One of the things that I want to remind everybody here at the dais is, and also with staff is it's going to take great courage to do some of these projects and make these connections. And I would advise you, don't back down <laughs> if it gets tricky, but just push forward. We've done these things, we've done hard things before. Um, these connections that uh, Carrie talked about are not gonna be easy. You're gonna be doing a lot of fun finding of funds. <laughs> An alliteration just for you, Jeff. Um, and then the other thing that I would say, which is like really off the wall, trash receptacles, they need to look inviting, like a shark's mouth. You know, it's like make the opening look inviting so people use the trash receptacles because you all know how much I love to get rid of trash in the city of Elk Grove. Yes. So, you know, on those on that note, you know, just if you need help, <laughs> and just so you know, the Trails Committee has heard this item and we've been uh, a part of all of all of these conversations. So um, I know it says in your report that the Planning Commission heard it, but we also heard it at Trails Committee. Um, just know that you're just going to, it's going to take courage to do some of this stuff and, you know, reach out. I'm available to chat about things and bounce ideas if it gets tricky. Okay? Take care. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Anderson. Yes. I don't see anyone else signed up to speak, so I will close the public comment opportunity and declare the public hearing is closed. Um, I do have some questions, um, Ms. Whitlock. Um, first and foremost, you know, I support this. Um, I think you, did, you laid it out very well. Uh, the connectivity to Sacramento and really making us connected to our greater region is so important and provides an excellent alternative for transportation needs and so forth. And the design concepts are, are great. And to address Ms. Anderson's um, concerns, if you will, 
on funding sources. You've outlined a, a, a wide variety of sources. So I appreciate seeing that. And I know that we're very tenacious at seeking um, federal dollars, state dollars, and wherever we can find money. So I am very optimistic about that. Um, my question, um, one, is in terms of engagement. So my comments are really strict, uh, going to be focused on the equestrian community and the rural community. Um, I had a chance to speak with Commissioner Murphy um, earlier uh, yesterday, and so brought me up to speed in terms of some of the deliberations that took place on the Planning Commission. And so one of the concerns that was raised during Planning Commission was um, how to make the trail safer for equestrian needs, one, but also is there a need for the equestrian um, group, if you will? So have we had any engagement out in that sort of subsector? So with this, um, we did do trail signs um, to get input along the, the sections of existing trail. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say specifically that we got a significant amount of input from the rural community. Um, we did hear some. I would say that we really, from an equestrian perspective, I think it's broader than just necessarily the Laguna Creek Trail on right. the east side. It's probably something that we need to look at in a, in a more comprehensive manner in terms of what makes sense, yeah. what would be used. You know, if we're going to put in the funding and provide maintenance to the equestrian trail, we really want to make sure that we're focusing in on those areas that would be used. Um, we have limited equestrian trails now, and um, they may be underutilized because of the short segments that mm -hmm. they provide. Mm -hmm. If you're going to go out for a trail ride, you probably want to do a little bit longer than having a and that's been some of the feedback I've heard as well, right. that they're and, underutilized. Yeah, and it's a question sort of of are they underutilized because there's not a good route, because there's not enough of them, because there's not enough length to be able to really make it worthwhile, or are they underutilized because there simply isn't the same number of people who would utilize them as maybe we had 20, 25 years ago. So I right. think that's something that we need to dig into more and do more specific outreach related to uh, that. that that's, and that's really where I'm getting at, because I know that some of the concerns from, again, this is I'm hearing this through Commissioner Murphy's lens, mm -hmm. is that he has spoken to some of the, the, the equestrian groups, if you will. And some of the concerns of the lack of utilization is safety concerns. Safety concerns for the horses. Um, there is, you know, the engagement between a dog and a horse is, is not always pleasant. And in fact, there's even, a, um, he had shared anecdotally that a horse actually had to be um, euthanized because he, it was attacked by a dog. So I don't know the circumstances around that. But in terms of, you know, sharing this, this space mm -hmm. with, with dogs and humans and bicyclists um, and making sure that it's safe mm -hmm. um, for not only the horses, but of course, all of those that are that are part of the trail system. And so my ask would be to have continued conversations yeah. um, to really make this stronger. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, if this is if there is a great need for it, then we need to be cognizant of how the trails will be utilized by um, the equestrian world, if you will. Absolutely. And and yeah, we did note that Commissioner Murphy, as you mentioned, brought it up when we went to Planning Commission, yep. and we have that note. Okay. I will say in our um, in our design guidelines in the mm -hmm. Bicycle Pedestrian Trail Master Plan that was adopted, we do have guidelines in terms of how to provide some separation with respect to equestrian trails if you're putting those in. So right. you have the sort of the the pa the paved trail section and uh, you know space before you have the equestrian trail is provided as our our design guideline. That's great. Yeah. So just that continued dialogue, reaching yeah. out to the rural community, always want them to feel that they're part of the decision making process. So yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I'll start to the right. Any questions or comments? Um, just Council Member Robles? I wanted to say thank you, Carrie, for um, the presentation. I, I do, I'm actually pretty excited about it. I've actually ran from Franklin all the way to consumeness, but I've always done the right side, not the left side. So coming back in, because um, it does, it is a little bit more dangerous on that side. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to say thank you for that because I'm I'm excited about the connectivity and then the um, allowing people to have accessible to different trails. So I like it. I utilize it. Um, I know that plenty of uh, the council members also utilize the trails too. So pretty excited about it. Thank you. 
Council Member Brewer. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. I want to thank you, Carrie, for providing the this report and real and just going through everything step by step. I, I had some questions and concerns beforehand. Some of the concerns that the mayor had conveyed, I share those as well, um, especially when you look at the, the at the aspects of safety, because uh, we know that Delmeyer Park is used on occasion for horseback riding, but as the city becomes more and more urbanized, uh, the trails become less and less safe for horses. And so just looking for ways to communicate with the rural community and with the equestrian community specifically on trying to find that bright line to make things more safer in that respect uh, could definitely could definitely go a long ways towards getting us towards that ideal um, pathway that we're looking for. And there was another part that I'm, that I'm looking at as well. When you look at Laguna Creek itself, you have the North Fork that's, that, that makes its way up to and beyond Calvine Road. Um, where Bradshaw Christian School and Sheldon High School are located, um, is that is, is that segment or part of that pathway for the trails? Is that part of a of, of a larger trails plan um, to be considered or to be discussed at, um, at at a near future date, or or would it be or, or is it too late to have it to be a part of this interregional trails plan? So that is um, that section is covered in the bicycle pedestrian trail master plan overall. Um, it's considered to be part of the power line trail um, and, and, and instead of being part of this Laguna Creek trail um, and the power line trail is is still in progress as well it's one of those that has some segments that are done but still has areas that need to be um, fully completed thank you for that clarity that really helps because as we because as you look at the right away that that goes north that goes northbound obviously there's a there's a natural trail space that goes with it and so um, just making sure that um, as we consider all options to making um, Elk Grove connected through our various networks of trails is uh, uh, definitely see this as being part of that mix. Um, but it's a really good report. I really like it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Vice Mayor Spees, any questions, comments? Just a couple quick comments. Um, um, first, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Whitlock. This is a, a great um, master plan. I appreciate it. Um, this and I will just quickly align myself relative to uh, the conversation about the equestrian um, portions. I think that needs to be um, have further conversations about that. And I don't want to lose this opportunity here to make sure that uh, we recognize and appreciate the input of the Trails Committee. They have had uh, a long uh, record of pushing, advocating um, for a vision of things that um, sometimes uh, we didn't we haven't seen I mean I, I was planning commissioner in 2014 and and I've heard the conversations over the years um, and sometimes you know the, the the committee wasn't entirely happy about decisions that were made at that time um, and that's okay right they're they're advocates and, and they continue to work for it I think this will be one of those um, crowning opportunities that when they do happen, I think it'll be something that um, will certainly be because uh, the Trails Committee has been has been fighting for it. So I wanted to make sure that I didn't lose this moment to say thank you to them. And so thank you very much. Council Member Soon. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, quickly, uh, I'll uh, echo the sentiments of my colleagues. Sounds like there's more work to be done on the, on the equestrian effort. Um, but I do wanna commend you, Carrie and Kaylee and the entire team on your outreach efforts and engagement with the community, all the things that, that you've done uh, to, to speak to our residents because they're the ones who's gonna be using this as we go forward. Um, I also wanna uh, give a shout out to Sharon Anderson and her tireless efforts of being a, a bicycle advocate as well as an anti-trash advocate. So thank you here for being here, Sharon. And I really do like her uh, input uh, about sharks or whatever, um, whatever garbage containers are, are more inviting. I think that's that's a good good comment. Maybe it's elks. Elks, oh, big, big open mouth elks, yeah. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm no, I don't like sharks, so yeah, that's, that's fine. But, um, uh, and then I, I'm just excited to see this progress. Uh, you know, this, 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 when it's built, will be a jewel uh, in Elk Grove and for the region. Uh, I'm also excited that it's part of the regional uh, trail master plan, and I hope that 
we can get funding from the Sacramento Area Council of Governments. Yeah, my fingers are crossed too, Kaylee. Thank you. You might sit on that, right? <laughs> <laughs> One of 28, but yeah, voices. But yeah, I will try, Mayor. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's get go forward and continue the progress on this. With that, I'd love to make a motion to adopt the staff's re recommendation. Great. We have a motion. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Thank you. All right. Next up is item 8.2. It's a public hearing and consideration of actions calling a special election and clearing results of the special election to annex certain territory as described to Community Facilities District Number 2006-1 Maintenance Services for the Esplanade West Project. Okay. Good, good evening, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor and Council Members. I'm Renee Attar, Finance Analyst for the City. I'm here this evening with a presentation for proposed annexations into the City Special Tax District. Um, so as you know, the City maintains eight special tax districts, provide funding for infrastructure for services ranging from police, maintenance, street maintenance, street lighting, and stormwater drainage. Annexations into the appropriate districts are typically part of a new development project's approval process. The requirements are specific for each project and vary according to the geographic location and building use. The special taxes are subject to annual rate adjustments. Um, it's only one project. Um, on January 11th of this year, the City Council adopted a resolution of intent to annex the parcels for the Esplanade West project into the CFD 2006-1 special tax district and to establish tonight's public hearing. This would make this the 88th annexation into this tax district, um, which provides fun, uh, funding for maintenance services throughout the city. And this assessment will be levied in perpetuity. Um, so the Esplanade West project consists of 315 single family units located southeast of Poppy Ridge Road and Bighorn Boulevard. This project was annexed into Police Services CFD 2003-2 and the Street Maintenance District um, on September 14th of 2022. And that concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. All right, excellent. I will declare the public hearing for CFD 2006-1, Annex 88 open, and open up the public comment opportunity. Nobody has signed up to speak, so I'll close the public comment opportunity and declare that the public hearing for CFD 2006-1 Annex 88 is now closed. And look for motion one. Motion one. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, may I request the results of the ballot tabulation, please? Indeed, of 315 possible votes, 315 affirmative votes were cast, authorizing the city of Elk Grove to levy a special tax at the rate of portion and described. The measure passes with more than two-thirds of all votes cast in the election in favor of the measure. Resolution declaring the results of the election is available for council consideration. Motion two. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 In motion three is introduced and waived full reading by substitution of title only an ordinance levying and apportioning the special tax in the 88th annexation to community facilities district number 2006-1 maintenance services and amending Elk Grove Municipal Code section 3.19.010. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All right, very good. Item 9.1. That's to receive the fiscal year 2022-23 mid-year budget report and consider a resolution amending that fiscal year budget as well as the position control listing. All right. Greetings, Mayor Singh Allen and uh, Vice Mayor Spies and fellow city council members. My name is Shay Narayan, your city budget manager. And uh, I'm here today to present a mid-year review of the current year budget. But before I get started, I want to thank uh, finance and budget analyst Cecilia Long and Matt Ruiz for assisting me with the staff report and resolution. So getting started with general fund revenues and how they're doing, we got a variety of general fund revenue sources, each with their own nature of business. And the table before you focuses on the significant revenue sources that have projected variances at year end, shown on the far right. So the bottom line shows that at mid-year, general fund revenues are 
currently projected to be uh, greater than the budget by over $1.3 million at year end. And therefore, staff is going to recommend that the budget for these sources uh, be modified to align with current projections. So of the variances between the current and proposed budgets uh, shown in the far right columns, the most notable dollar-wise are in property tax in lieu of vehicle license fees, property transfer tax, transient occupancy tax, and great plates revenues. So based on info provided by the county, property taxes in lieu of vehicle license fees will be greater than the budget by over $450,000. Uh, because the city is aware of this amount, uh, staff recommends amending the prop tax in lieu of VLF budget to equal the projection. The county recently uh, provided a report to the city on property transfer tax revenues received year to date. And based on that report, actuals at mid-year are actually trending below budget. Uh, for every month of the first half of the fiscal year, revenues along with uh, the number of real estate sales within the city uh, have declined when compared to the same month in the prior year. Uh, we also have received some recent reports from the city's property tax consultant showing uh, year over year declines in real estate activity as well. So staff recommends decreasing this uh, revenue budget accordingly. Transient occupancy taxes, uh, also known as hotel taxes, have been trending significantly above budget projections throughout the fiscal year, actually. The positive trend is attributed to an ongoing uh, post-pandemic recovery in the hotel sector and also from occupancy at the new, fairly new, Marriott uh, Town Place Suites, uh, Elk Grove's newest hotel, so projecting revenues for a, a fairly newer hotel, such as Town Place Suites, can be challenging given the lack of historical revenue data. So we'll, we'll try to do better next year. Uh, in the spring of 2020, the city participated in the Great Plates Delivered program, delivering meals to seniors during the pandemic. Uh, the final reimbursements were actually received uh, this fiscal year, uh, totaling $608,000. The city had anticipated receiving these revenues in the prior fiscal year, but there were delays in receiving the payment from the state. So I've just summarized all of these points here in this slide about those four uh, revenue sources uh, being the major ones that we're proposing to amend at this council meeting. So now moving on to talking about general fund spending. Uh, now looking at that, the city has spent nearly $34 million, which is about 39% of the current year budget at mid-year. Current spending trends will likely result in a savings of over $3.4 million by year end. The primary source, sources of savings this year in the general fund are associated with salaries and benefits uh, or compensation. The drivers of the savings are ongoing vacancies in the city and delayed hiring of certain positions. So before we use a table, similarly to the prior table showing general fund spending information at mid-year, the bottom line essentially shows the nearly $34 million uh, spent at this time in mid-year in the YTD activity column and uh, the over $3.4 million in projected savings in the projected YE budget variance column. So $2.2 million from salaries and $1.2 million from benefits. Based on trend analysis at mid-year, staff is recommending reducing the salary and benefits budget to equal the current projection. And staff is recommends splitting the 3.4 in salaries and benefits between 1.7 million, okay, transferring to the PERS prepayment budget line, and then 1.7 million, the other half, transferring to the general capital reserve. So then combined with the 1.3 million that I had mentioned earlier, uh, additional revenues, so we're looking at a total of about $3 million being transferred to the General Capital Reserve. So now moving away from the general fund, getting into some major non-general funds, specifically development-related enterprise funds. For development services, revenues have been trending close to budget overall. Salary and benefits spending are uh, trending slightly below budget due to unforeseen vacancies within the department. Operating spending, primarily in the planning and engineering services divisions, are trending below budget as well due to a lapse in recording billable work performed by our consultants. 
for the roadway fee and other major CFF funds, so CFF capital facility fee funds, revenues at mid-year are generally trending, uh, I would say, well above projections. For certain funds, actually, revenues at mid-year have already exceeded the budget. So the higher than expected revenue activity is indicative that even during a real estate activity slowdown in the region, private new construction activity remains strong citywide. For all these funds, spending activity typically trends a low in the first half of the year. For large projects, specifically CIP projects, the construction season starts later in the second half of the year, so large capital projects uh, can often span multiple years, resulting in low spending at times. For the drainage fund, uh, revenues are currently trending low, but when considering the timing of drainage billing, property tax collections, interfund transfers, uh, actual revenues are projected to equal budget at year end. And with the roadway and CFF funds, um, drainage spending typically trends low in the first half of the year for the same reasons I had mentioned earlier. Uh, recycling and waste revenues are currently also trending below budget. Uh, however, as I mentioned with drainage, when we're considering the timing of receipts from Republic Services and also interfund transfers, revenues are still projected to meet budget. And, and spending actually in waste is a little bit low right now due to some unforeseen vacancies within the department and also to savings from an unanticipated Senate Bill 1383 organics recycling grant received for $252,000, help with the carts distribution. So now moving away from the budget status segment of the presentation into the proposed amendments section of the presentation. So as mentioned earlier, staff uh, recommends paying an additional 1.7 million toward the city's unfunded pension liability in addition to the already budgeted 900,000 uh, from July and then transferring the 3 million I mentioned before toward the capital reserve. Staff is uh, recommending increasing funding in the Neighborhood Stabilization Fund. I haven't brought that fund up in, in a few years, uh, by about 178,000. Funding was received years ago from the Housing and Economic Recovery Act grant uh, for the rehabilitation and of abandoned and foreclosed properties. The Adamstown Construction Project will complete rehab work on a home that the city purchased from its tax sale. After completion, the house will be used as a shared housing opportunity for formerly homeless seniors. It is expected that the project, estimated at nearly 400,000, will start this fiscal year and then complete next fiscal year. And this slide is focused on budget amendments purely for the Public Works Department. Staff recommends increasing spending in the Public Works Admin Fund by 100,000 to provide supplemental professional services assistance to the CIP group due to delays in filling vacancies. Staff was recently notified by the state that overhead allocation expenses are not eligible under the Senate Bill 1 Local Streets and Road funding. Hence, uh, it was recommended by division staff to record those expenditures to the Measure A Maintenance Fund, rather since that fund can provide adequate support in lieu of SB1. The total impact between the funding exchange between Measure A and SB1 is $479,000. In the Measure A traffic fund, uh, the professional services budget is typically used to fund the speed control program. However, uh, inadvertently, that budget did not get thrown into the book this year, so staff proposes to increase spending by $42,000 to replenish funding for speed control. Staff recommends increasing budget expenses in the Fleet and Facilities Fund by $85,000 due to unexpected increases in fuel prices, which I'm sure we've all felt at some point in the last few months, uh, and greater than anticipated vehicle usage for the city. In addition, there are unanticipated repair and maintenance costs this year for city hall campuses uh, due to delayed installation of new HVAC units. So concluding the budget amendment portion of the presentation and the last segment is talking about precision control. So the table before you shows staff's recommended changes to the current fiscal year position control listing. Most of these changes are either proposed reclassifications to current positions 
uh, or corrections to the position control listing shown in the adopted budget book for this year. The proposed reclassifications are resulting either from recent desk audits performed uh, or from an evaluation of job duties and scope for these positions. Uh, as, as discussed in a staff report from January 11th, supplemental law enforcement services funding will cover the cost of this new uh, admin assistant position at the bottom of the table uh, through approximately September of 2024. And determining how to fund the position beyond that point will be considered in future budget processes. Uh, but for this fiscal year, there's sufficient funding to cover and accommodate the proposed changes before you. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and move over to staff's recommendation that the council adopt a resolution amending the fiscal year 2022-23 budget and approving changes to the position control listing. All right, thank you for that excellent report. Mr. Narayan, I'll start to my left this time. Any questions or comments? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Shay, I just always thank you for your, you always provide a thorough report and it's very, Simple for everybody to understand. So thank you for your efforts there, and just pleased to see the transient, transient occupancy tax uh, increasing beyond expectations. It's great news for our city. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I would agree, of course, uh, with everything that uh, Council Member Soon had to say. Uh, I do have a qu quick question about. I haven't heard of this Youngstown project before. Just Adamstown. curious. Adamstown. 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 My apologies. Uh, how many? How many um, folks will that help, just out of curiosity? That is a great question. Uh, I don't believe our housing and public services manager is present oh, at the meeting, okay. but. No worries, it, that was, I was just a point of curiosity. So we'll, we'll figure it out tomorrow, not a problem. It, probably an easy answer. Okay, so uh, with that, I don't have any other questions, but thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Council Member Brewer. Good report, Shay. Um, definitely understood everything. It was clear. It was it was more than clear as mud. It was crystal clear for me. Um, looking at the speed control programs, um, do we always rely on Measure A funds to cover the costs for those, or do we rely on like other sort of grants that we can get through OCTA or? So there's a portion of Measure A. So Measure A is a portion of different ways. We have uh, we have bike and ped traffic and safety and we have maintenance. Yeah. So the traffic and safety funding is regular sales tax dollars we get through STA. So we, we, we often annually use that for a speed control program. It's typically adequate uh, and it still is. Uh, we just, we inadvertently didn't include that in this year, but we typically do. So, uh, and, and the public works director, Jeff Warner, can answer if it's adequate or inadequate to fund the Well, the answer program. is yes. We typically fund that program using Measure A funds. Uh, it's an appropriate use of the funds and, and is really helpful. Um, the problem is it just, we asked for the money it inadvertently got left out. So we need to replenish it at this time. It's not an increase in expense in any way. It's consistent with what we projected at the beginning of the year. So any sort of grants that we apply for through the Office of Traffic Safety, does that get included into this budget or no? It, it would if those grants were received. Um, I'm not aware that we've pursued or um, that those grants were available to us, but we can certainly look into that. Okay, no, that's good. No, that's, that's definitely good. I, I was just I was thinking on that in that respect because when we talk about speed control programs, there's a lot of different things that we consider in the mix. Um, it's just whether there's enough budget funding through Measure A or if we could apply through a, a myriad of funding models, um, obviously they're at our disposal. We should be able to use them. But I just I, I like the report. I like how everything was laid out um, mm -hmm. and provides a, a good um, pathway for us as we consider the the, the, the budget later on this year. This mid year budget um, hits all the right notes and, and and definitely gets to our hits to our needs um, in in a major way. So thank you. Thank you. Council Member Robles. Thank you for that thorough presentation. Um, I'm actually pretty excited to hear more um, as we move forward about the funds that we're gonna be helping out our seniors in the transitional housing. I think that's a very key component and it shows a lot of who we are as all Grove that we care for our folks. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, you know, what's great is that our fiscal health is strong and that's always great to see. And as it relates to the TOT increases, you know, I sit on Visit California and actually this morning I got we got an update 
Um, this is consistent with what's happening statewide. People are traveling again. They're traveling throughout the state and, and elsewhere. So you're seeing, I think it was in the staff report, there's certain industries that are performing much better this year than, um, than years past uh, with uh, consumer goods spending, the fuel service and gas station industry, restaurants and hotels are all coming back strong. So we're seeing that rise in TOT, but it's also contributing directly to these, uh, the revenues that we're seeing. Um, I also noticed that in the staff report, you had mentioned some that we are spending more on our vehicle uh, abatement program, um, but there is a legislation that Assemblymember Wynn has introduced along with uh, the Sacramento Transportation Authority, uh, Assembly Bill 333, that will um, es essentially bring back the, the funding mechanism for the vehicle abatement program, which has expired and therefore leaving jurisdictions to sort of pay their own way. So it's great to see that bill and uh, we'll be advocating for that. Um, to make sure that, again, other jurisdictions are made whole as well. Uh, thank you. Excellent report. Uh, with that, I'll look for a motion. I'll make the motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Very good. All right. Thank you, sir. Next item. I'll take us to item 9.2 to receive a presentation on recent economic development activities and information. <laughs> we'll make sure it's working. The floor um, is yours. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, members of the Council. I'm Daryl Doan. I'm your Economic Development Director. It's wonderful, as always, to be here in front of you. Uh, the item I have for you tonight is our um, annual report. Um, so there's no requirement in the municipal code to do this or anything like that. It's just something that I like to do. Um, because of the sort of complexities of economic development and how it touches everything in the city in some way or another. I think it's important that we report to you about what we're doing um, and more importantly report to the public about what we're doing. Um, so we do this every year, although I will caveat we did not do it last year. So this is a uh, long story, uh, but this is actually a two-year annual report. So I don't know that would, what that would make it, a biannual report. Okay. so. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit. This is going to be remedial for three of you and new for two of you. So uh, bear with me, but I'm going to go through a little bit of uh, just what we do and how we do it because I think it's important. Then we'll get into some results of what we've accomplished in the last two years. So this is our leadership team, these uh, lovely, smiling people with two new members that we're excited to have. Um, so enough said there. Uh, this is who we are. This is our department. Um, uh, these uh, good-looking gentlemen with amazing hair, Jason Behrman on the left, Daryl Doan in the middle, Luis Aguilar on the right. Um, this is a, a fabulous team, best city manager I've ever worked for, and honestly the best employee uh, I've ever had in my 24 years now of doing this, Luis Aguilar, who incidentally was just promoted um, from specialist to manager, and he's, he's sitting back. Where'd he go? Ah. He's sitting right there looking resplendent with his purple tie. All right, so this is us and uh, more about what we do. Um, we have a, a vision, mission, uh, values, and goals. Um, recently updated, actually. Um, all, all city departments are updating their departmental um, uh, items like this. And so our, our vision is an innovative, inclusive, and resilient economy. So very simple and short. Um, our mission is simply to cultivate economic opportunity for everybody for businesses and for residents across all classes, races, socioeconomic status, neighborhoods, um, you name it. And we want to cultivate op economic opportunity because we believe strongly that, uh, that strong economies make strong communities. That's a pretty simple sentiment, but it is really the essence of what we do and why I do it and, and, and why I get up every morning. I really believe that as, a, as an employee, as a resident, um, uh, if there's wealth in the community, the community is better off. Um, our values, um, we are ethical, we are inclusive, we are transparent, and we are innovative. There's probably 10 more I could add to that, but 
Uh, these are the four that I like that I think really capture how we try to operate. Um, the goals of economic development in the city of Elk Grove, we want companies to locate, stay, and grow here. Um, we want thriving business districts. We want employees that live and work in the city. Um, we want an expanding tax base, and we want to create, again, economic opportunity uh, for all. Um, so our strategic focus is, is currently around these four areas. So business support, um, that is very broad. Um, all businesses are important, whether you are big or small. All businesses are critical, whether you are uh, local or national, whether you're a chain or a, a small business on Main Street. Um, we support them all. We support them all equally. Um, we have programs and activities that help businesses locate, stay, and grow here. Um, innovation. Um, economy, you've heard me say this, economies that don't innovate stagnate. Uh, maybe that's becoming a cliche coming from me, but, but I really believe that. Um, we're in an information age and an information economy increasingly with a dispersed workforce. That is not your grandfather's economy, right? And so we need to, we need to respect our past and our heritage and those more traditional businesses, but we need to be looking to innovate as an economy. So programs and activities to support and attract innovative technology-based companies with high growth potential. Placemaking. Um, we need great neighborhoods. We need great business districts. The kinds of companies that we want to locate, stay, and grow here are increasingly looking for um, amazing neighborhoods, amazing districts, um, not your typical suburban fair. Um, and I think we need to do a better job as a city of elevating our levels of architecture and placemaking and sustainability and walkability and urban density. So that's an important area of focus. And finally, infrastructure. Um, which is not something that I directly control, um, but I have friends, and um, uh, building infrastructure is absolutely critical to helping companies locate, stay, and grow here. Every pothole, every trail, every road, every utility line, all of that. If, if we do not have modern, adequate, properly sized infrastructure in proximity to those great business districts, we will not attract companies and we will not keep them here. Um, luckily, we have who I think is um, uh, the best public works director in the entire region, a, a young, aggressive, innovative uh, guy, uh, Jeff Warner. Uh, so we're in good hands on the infrastructure side. He didn't ask me to say that. Um, so my office provides a suite of services to businesses. Um, this, this is a lot of fluff for my website. I'm not going to go through it all. But um, you know, if you are a business, and you need help making a locational decision, or uh, you know, if you're threatening to come here, that's great. If you're threatening to leave, we want to know about it. And if you're doing great, we want to know about that too. Uh, and so we engage with businesses on a daily basis, and we help them. Uh, we help clear a path for their success. And a lot of that revolves around clearing a path through um, what many businesses believe to be sort of a clunky. Uh, government bureaucracy. I do not think we are that, but many businesses believe that. And so a lot of what we do is about helping them get situated in the city. We do that through site selection. We help, uh, we help companies find uh, adequate facilities. We fast track approvals. Um, we're pretty fast to begin with because of uh, Darren Wilson over there and his team. Um, but if you are trying to do something unique or special or innovative, we want to move you through our process as quickly as possible so you can get up and operating. We help companies uh, with talent. Um, talent is the still, still in this uh, economy the number one determinant of whether a business chooses a community. It's not cost. It's not incentives. It's talent, right? And so um, if you have a hiring need, uh, we want to help you. And uh, new to our activities are kind of the opposite of that, which is helping our residents upskill themselves so they can take those uh, positions with the companies we are attracting here. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Small business support, um, I mean, that falls under just general business support. Um, again, uh, all businesses are um, important to me, um, but small businesses have a specific set of needs. Um, and challenges, and uh, we have great people like Luis who, who engage every day with our small businesses and try to meet their needs. Um, startups, we talked about innovation. Um, startups are not the be all and end all of innovation. You can be an innovative Main Street company, you can be an innovative barber shop, you can be an innovative dog walker, but generally speaking, right, uh, innovation is coming through technology verticals and things like 
information technology, AI, VR, cybersecurity, places like that. And so we have, uh, we have a program to help identify the next great Elk Grove startup. Um, incentives. Incentives are sometimes thought of as a dirty word in economic development to some people. Um, we are, uh, you've heard me say this, we have incentives. Um, we don't dole them out um, crazily um, because it's taxpayer money. We're very judicious and methodical about uh, what businesses uh, qualify for an incentive and we always structure incentives in a way that protect the taxpayer. Um, but we do have programs, and they're pretty innovative programs, and we're pretty proud of them. Uh, the best set of programs uh, really in the Sacramento region. Um, we have an Umbrella Economic Development Incentive Program. That, that's the actual name. It was named before I got here. We need a better marketing name if anybody has any ideas. But the Economic Development Incentive Program is this broad policy that the council has adopted that gives me and my staff and, and all of our departments flexibility to, in a very targeted way, help a business make a locational decision or an expansion decision um, with some taxpayer money involved. Um, we always try to structure that such that it is performance-based. You don't get the money unless you create the jobs. You don't get the money unless you create the tax increases. Um, we have a, an entire program, again, around startups, so I won't uh, talk anymore about that. We have um, what I understand to be the state's, uh, state of California's only municipal incentive program geared towards state and federal office uh, um, headquarters projects. Um, we have the capability to do retail and hospitality incentives. Um, one of our largest incentive is, is a tax rebate that goes to Costco. Um, and we share in those taxes for a number of years. That helped get them here. Um, was not without controversy. Uh, but what I tell people is, um, would you rather have 50% uh, of something or 100% of nothing, right? We can play a game of chicken with businesses about whether they're going to come here, or we can step in and partner with them and ensure that they will be here, and then share in that wealth. And eventually these tax credits, um, these tax rebates burn off, and we keep all the money in perpetuity at that point. So that's just one example of how we help retail and hospitality. Um, we do defer impact fees. You'll hear from developers. Um, Rod and Sergio, you may hear this especially because you're new, that our fees are too high. The rest of you heard this too, right? That we're, that we're, just, we're just putting up barriers to projects coming to Elk Grove. Our fees are not too high. Our fees are competitive. They're regionally competitive. We check this constantly. Every time we bring a fee program to you, it comes with that check. Um, but a developer has never met a fee that they didn't like or that, that they did like. And so we created this program. We were one of the first, um, we were the first in the region to do this, um, where we, we will not lower your fees um, because that's not equitable, but we will defer your fees and essentially give you a loan on very favorable terms um, to help move your project forward. And then this is new, the Small Business Permit Assistance Program. Mr. Aguilar was responsible for building this and bringing it to council and getting its approval, but especially for small businesses, um, a barrier to opening and moving forward with the project is often um, city um, plan review and entitlement fees. We have to charge fees. We, 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 our enterprises operate on a cost recovery basis. Um, but you know, a $10,000 bill at City Hall because you're trying to get a CUP or get your design review done or get a tenant improvement permit um, can be the difference between a small business launching or not. And so we provide um, really to any business that is breathing, <laughs> we provide up to $10,000 of direct assistance credit to their account. And most of our business, small businesses now, can go through the city's process without paying a dime. We're very proud of that program. So I'm going to get into some recent accomplishments. Um, again, this covers two years. There's, there's too much to list. Um, but these are some highlights and I think just the sense of the things that we do. Um, business recovery grants in response to COVID. Um, my department led efforts. We provided 328 grants to businesses that were struggling. They had to demonstrate a loss related to COVID, totaling $1.8 million. Um, we had that program open for a long time. I would have liked to have seen three times these amounts, but this is what we got, and we paid those grants, and I, and I think in a real way, um, we kept uh, especially some of our small businesses open and um, during uh, the difficulties of the pandemic. Project Elevate, you hear me talk about this a lot. This goes back to placemaking as a goal, right? 
Project Elevate is, is a 20 acre, four block, dense, urban, walkable, sustainable district that we're trying to build. I'm not at District 56. Across the street from District 56 on 20 acres of city owned property, it's an incredibly unique opportunity for a city to, to initiate this type of development. I'm very excited about that. Um, in the last year, we led efforts to identify and select uh, Heinz as the city's development partner um, and are looking forward to continued progress on that project. The Elk Grove Zoo, another, sig I mean, I would argue these are our two most signature projects. Um, some of my colleagues may disagree with me, but that's okay. This is, that's what I think. Um, we, the, my department led the efforts to attract the, the Sacramento Zoological Society to Elk Grove. Um, as the home of its relocated Sacramento Zoo, or the potential home, I should say. Still a lot to be done. And we oversaw the successful purchase of the 100-acre parcel off of uh, Camera Road for its potential future home. I've now turned that over into the capable hands of Mr. Christopher Jordan, uh, also young, aggressive, innovative, and extremely good looking, who is an amazing department head in SPI. Uh, he also did not tell me to say that. Um, <laughs> I never have anything to report, Councilman. <laughs> um, Kubota. Um, this was another big win for us. Um, we led efforts to attract uh, Kubota, which is a Japanese-based tractor manufacturer to Elk Grove. Um, we are, that project is now under construction. Um, we oversaw the sale of city land to them and uh, worked with our very capable development services team to fast track their project approvals. Darren is meeting with them, I think, what, every couple hours at this point to try to get that project wrapped up and opened. Um, but very exciting project, really one of our first major successes at attracting a foreign-based company to Elk Grove. Um, although it's a U.S. subsidiary, we are now the home of their Western Distribution Center, one of only three such investments in the entire um, United States. Pitch Elk Grove. I, a few of you were there. You remember this event. This was awesome. Uh, part of our startup support program, we were trying to figure out how do we attract more startups? How do we get the word out about this really unique, innovative program um, to our residents who might be entrepreneurs and to the rest of the region? And uh, we thought, well, we could, we could spend a bunch of money on advertising, which, which rarely works, honestly, in economic development, or we could put on a signature event and draw people to that event, like moths to a flame. People in the startup ecosystem young people, venture capitalists, serial entrepreneurs that have never been to Elk Grove and would probably never come to Elk Grove because they're all you know, down in Midtown or whatever, being cool. We wanted to bring them here to our little suburban environment and, um, and we gave away some money. We had over 200 attendees. We had 30 companies um, competing in the pitch contest and now we're gonna make that a signature annual event. Very excited about that. Um, we talked about our small business permit assistance program. I won't. Uh, repeat myself, but to date we've given away um, over $40,000 in that program. Uh, the majority of those uh, grants are small, they're $2,500 or $3,000, um, but it makes a big difference. Grantline Business Park. Um, so this is, um, this was actually led by our Strategic Planning and Innovation Department, um, and we were writing shotgun on this, but it really you know, it really doesn't matter what department is doing the work. Everything we do at the city impacts um, a business's ability to be successful. Um, this was an annexation of 400 acres of county land at Grant Line and Waterman Road into the city in southeast Elk Grove. Um, the city led that annexation. It wasn't developer-led. We, we recognized a need for additional land to be zoned industrial in the city and we needed a new business park, and so we took this on. Um, the land was annexed, it was pre-zoned, certified EIR in place, um, and general plan amendments completed, and all of that helps expedite future projects as they come forward. The camera urban design study, this was another one led by my friends at SPI, but this is a re-envisioning of a portion of the old, well, it's not that old, but the SEPA plan um, as, a, as a more, um, a different vision of part of that plan is a thriving urban sustainable commercial corridor along Camera Road and prominent par Promenade Parkway. Uh, more to come on that too. Um, and uh, the completion of the Camera Road Phase One uh, project, which was the widening and re-engineering—I think I'm getting those terms right—of uh, Camera Road 
um, between Promenade Parkway and Bruceville. And in the future, we're going to punch that all the way through to I-5. So we've got a lot of things coming up. Um, too many to tell you about. Uh, this isn't all going to be done before the next annual report. Um, some of this stuff is going to take years, but uh, I'm going to run through this real quickly. We're going to we're going to launch a workforce development program tonight, here, later. Luis is going to be talking to you about it. Um, we're going to go in and install infrastructure in the Grant Line Business Park to make that even more developable. That area alone, incidentally, can support about five million square feet of development. Uh, just those 400 acres. We're going to complete all the work we've been doing over the years at uh, at Railroad Street. The uh, residences project is about to start just south of uh, Dust Bowl, and then we've got a new restaurant that's going to open soon-ish. <laughs> and we're, we're helping them with some other things to get them open. Um, Project Elevate, we're going to bring back a concept design and, and hopefully a development agreement to you in the next year. We're going to launch a new um, incentive program targeted specifically to breweries, restaurants, and wineries um, to get them in and help meet their unique needs. Uh, so that we can enhance our restaurant base um, in Elk Grove and hopefully bring in some more non-chain offerings. Um, Luis cleverly named that the brew program, so we're going to go with that. Um, yeah, it's pretty good, right? Um, we're going to try to launch a P-bid in our historic downtown. Historic downtown Elk Grove needs some organizing principles amongst merchants and property owners to help it thrive. And so we are, we've tried this in the past, and it didn't work. But that doesn't mean we don't keep trying, and a few years have passed, and I think we can do it. Um, and Rod, you and I will be talking more about that. Um, the Camer Urban Design Study General Plan and Zoning Amendments. We've done the plan. Now we need to make the plan a requirement. And we do that by putting those plan elements in the general plan. And in our zoning ordinance, um, we're going to look at what to do with the historic downtown library. That is a building that will soon be empty and needs to be reused, and there's a lot of people circling around wanting to use it. Um, we're going to try to find the best use for the community for that building. Uh, we're going to further, we're going to extend Camera Road all the way to I-5, as I said. Uh, we're going to do another phase of the historic downtown streetscape, streetscape project. Um, the, we're going to bring back for you a schematic design and a five minutes plan and approvals, hopefully, for the zoo. And we're going to update the Old Town Special Planning Area. So again, this is not all stuff that I do. A lot of it is. Uh, but it's a partnership with myself and my colleagues. You'll notice I don't call Old Town Old Town too much. I call it Historic Downtown because I think it's a better name. OK, so business development. This is, this is sort of the meat and potatoes of what we do, how we support businesses, particularly how we attract businesses. Uh, we generate leads, right? Leads in sales language. That's just a business that we know about um, that is, has a facility need. We engage them. We build a relationship. We turn a lead into a prospect. A prospect is a business who is now actively evaluating Elk Grove uh, for a location. And we turn a prospect into a locate. Um, a locate is a business that has made a decision to be here. I see a typo. And is actively moving forward with approvals and permits. And then we turn a locate into an opening. The key thing here is our job is not done until a business is open. We, we are we are in the, the open the doors business, largely the construction business, right? We, uh, um, we need to get a business into a suitable facility in Elk Grove that often involves building new facilities because we do not have a surplus of great second generation usable space. Um, that is one of our Achilles heels, uh, but sometimes it includes existing space. So when a business is open, we take credit for it, right? We track our stats in economic development, not to toot our horn, but because our residents want to know how many jobs we're creating, how we're impacting the tax base. Uh, when it's open, we take credit. So um, these are locates over the last two years. This is every locate. So again, that's a, that's a business that has made a decision to be here, but is not yet open. They're still going through the process. Um, so over the last two years, we've had 34 locates over 5,000 square feet. There's probably several hundred below 5,000 square feet but we just can't track them. We don't have that bandwidth and we don't have that data. Um, so these are so what we'll report on is businesses over 5,000 square feet, which usually, frankly, have the larger employment impact and um, tax base impact. So 34 locates in two years um, has the potential to produce almost 4,000 jobs using industry standard metrics for estimating that. 2.4 million square feet that rep would, if all of it was built, and that's still a big F, right? A lot of locates, don't execute, and they fade away. Um, 
But if they were all built, that would result in almost $611 million of capital investment in our, in our city. Those are all of the locates. That's a horrible slide, I apologize. But if anybody's really interested, you can read all that fine print. So we're not making this stuff up. Um, here's a good example of a locate, and I just use this as an example. But Slakey Brothers, you guys know this building? Uh, I-5 in Laguna, they've been here for decades. They're based in Oregon. They're not sexy. They are the makers of plumbing and HVAC equipment, <laughs> makers and distributors. Um, they are in about 195,000 square feet at that facility, and they have an application in to expand that to by another 207,000 square feet. They'll be a 400,000 square foot manufacturer uh, or distributor of their products. And in addition, they're bringing a manufacturing line to Elk Grove. So there'll be workers there making those products that they then sell. They distribute wholesale and they sell right out of their facility. They're one of our largest sales tax producers. Who, who would have knew that? But um, that's an example of Locate. We helped this company. We built a relationship with them. They reached out to us for help. How do I do my project? How do I get through the city's processes? What's it going to cost? Can you fast track that for me? And that's an example of what we do. We roll up our sleeves and we help businesses do that. If the expansion goes through, it's going to be about 275 jobs. Um, these are the openings. So these are businesses that have pulled the certificate of occupancy. I assume they're still open today. I'm not out counting. Some businesses open and then close relatively shortly, right? And we try to track the ones we know about. One thing I tell my council members is there's no magic database that tells me who's open and who's closed and how many employees they have. That's just not a thing. Um, we have some data from our own sources like business licenses. Where we struggle is not with who is open, who is open, it's with who is closed. These were the openings over the last uh, 30 years. Again, in excess of 5,000 square feet, there were 30 businesses totaling uh, over 900 jobs and some pretty impressive um, you know, square footage, $53 million of capital investment, $22 million of sales tax over 10 years. These are estimates that we make because we have to put numbers to these things to track our progress. Um, and about $446 million of payrolls over the next 10 years, if they all stay open and are successful, which, of course, we can't guarantee. Um, those are those openings. Um, these are closings. There aren't many closings in Elk Grove, right? I mean, we have a very constrained sort of commercial real estate portfolio. It's not a lot, so it's not that hard to kind of keep track of this. And when we do have a closing, it is typically retail. And when retail does close, it typically refills quickly. And so that's what you see a lot um, in Elk Grove. Um, again, if we want to be transparent, that's one of our values. Um, there's not a good source of data on business closings. Um, we, we really try to keep our ear to the ground to track these things, at least the larger ones. Um, these are the incentives we provided over the last two years. I told you we're very judicious and methodical, and we're not just throwing taxpayer money around. I think this is proof. Um, we provided two small grants to a couple of startup companies, and we provided a loan. I mean, you could, you could say that's not even really an incentive. It is an incentive, but it's not a subsidy. Let's put it that way. Um, to Kubota, which incidentally, I believe that's the largest um, impact fee deferral deal we've done. Um, this is everybody who received a small business permit assistance grant. Just quickly, market indicators, I like to report out on this. This is our population over the last 20 years. You can see we're in a bit of a leveling period in the last two or three years. Um, I'm not sure how to explain that. I'd have to think about that, but that is the data. Um, our unemployment rate uh, in, 21 in, in 2021 and 2022, um, you can see you know, post-pandemic, we're actually lower right now than we were in 2021. By any economist standard, that is the definition of full employment. And we've never really had a problem with employment in Elk Grove. Elk Grove home values. Um, also sort of, you know, you see that steady trend line in 2021, and then you see some changes due to COVID and everybody working from home and some maybe some Bay Area residents coming here and paying cash for homes, and you see that big price spike. It's leveled a little bit. Um, it's still probably too high for a lot of people. Well, it is too high for a lot of people. And we have an affordability problem that we maybe didn't have seven years ago when I took this job. Um, but it is still, by California standards, relatively affordable. These are rents. This is our sales tax collection over the last two years. Um, we're doing really strong. We are, we are a fiscally sound city. 
Um, and Measure E will only make us more so. You see a nice trend line there on the right. You see some, some Vs, and some of that was um, certainly COVID, but um, we weathered the storm of COVID pretty well from an economic standpoint. Um, not, not necessarily a health standpoint. There were businesses that closed and, and residents that struggled, but from a purely economic standpoint, um, we weathered the storm really well, actually. Um, hotel occupancy, hotel tax is one of the key market indicators that we track. We do that through occupancy and revenue, which equates to hotel tax. Um, as the mayor said, um, people are traveling again. We generally hover occupancy rates at our hotels over about 80%, which is the usually the highest in our segment, which is two and three star limited service in the entire Sacramento region. Uh, and we have some of the highest, what's called RevPAR. We do have the highest RevPAR in those segments in the entire region. Our problem is we only have seven hotels, and we need more. We do have two more on the horizon. Um, office vacancy, pretty standard. You would think because of COVID, this would be a lot higher. Remember, this is vacancy from a leasing perspective, not a who's there perspective. You can have companies that have left but are still obligated to pay that lease if the landlord won't let them out of it. But again, we're not a huge office destination, and so we didn't have a lot to lose. And we had, you know, we're a pretty sustainable economy. Um, and so that's office. This is industrial. This is a problem. We don't have a lot of industrial space, and what we have is completely um, occupied. And so when a new company comes in, it's a struggle to find them a space. And a lot of times they end up going to places like Rancho Cordova, where there's, they have the opposite problem of us. Not enough houses, way too much commercial space. So a lot of times the value proposition in Elk Grove for an industrial user is how can we get you a building built? Retail vacancy, we've never had a problem with retail vacancy. Where there is, there, there is one vacancy that's been vacant for the seven years that I've been here. Um, everything else fills within six months. It's the sports chalet sp space over by um, Scandinavian Designs. Crazy property owner, bad marketing, um, and I think they make their year's worth of revenue on Halloween spirit. Um, and then we also track lease and uh, sales transactions because that's an important uh, economic indicator of health. Um, we have great partners. We invite you to follow us. Um, I'll just end by saying I've never been more bullish on Elk Grove um, and a bigger believer in, in what we can accomplish as a community. Um, I think we are on the cusp of, um, and I'm not, this is not hyperbole, I think we're on the cusp of greatness. Um, we are so quickly moving from a suburb to a city, and we need to be a city. It's not sustainable to be a suburb. And we have so much opportunity left in this city, and I just couldn't be happier with the work that we're doing. Um, a great council, a great city manager, and great colleagues. So with that, I will end and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, excellent, excellent report. Um, before we open it up to questions here on the dais, I will open up the public comment opportunity. And I see one speaker signed up, Ms. Sharon Anderson. Thank you again for allowing me to speak. I figured I'm sitting through the meeting. I might as well say uh, <laughs> I don't really know how to bring this one up. <clears throat> it's that nexus between economic development, placemaking, and the right place to put things. I know we have zoning, and I know we already have a general plan that says what goes where, and by right, what can go where. I, would, I don't know how we can open that back up to say protect our riparian corridors, do not put mini storage places along riparian corridors, or don't put industrial along these beautiful things. We deserve in Elk Grove to have restaurants and vibrant other things for more people to be able to enjoy our riparian corridors. We don't have much left with respect to where we have these corridors or where we're now our channels that are going to become new riparian corridors. I just don't know how the how to how to even converse about this. I've tried to talk with, you know, our our folks here um, and I, I honestly, I just don't know where to go with this. I just know that we need to do something different, and I don't know. You're the only ones that can direct your staff to go back and take a look and not do what we've already done. So that's it. And I think that would be, um, 
I think that will help with our placemaking and it will help maximize some of the goals of showcasing our natural environment. All right, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. I do not have anyone else signed up to speak, so I will go ahead and close the public comment opportunity. Did we lose Mr. Down? Oh, he's right there. Okay. <laughs> All right, I will open it up for questions and comments. I'll start to the right. Councilmember Robles. Thank you, Daryl, for this um, update. Definitely extensive, and but it, you said it's been, what, two years? So thank you for that. Uh, I'm pretty excited for where the direction that Elk Grove's going. I think we have a really good opportunity, a unique opportunity to bring a lot of more vibrant and life um, to our city. I'm pretty tired already of, of keep on here in the bedroom community. Um, I think that Elk Grove is better than a bedroom community. I think that we have a really good opportunity to bring restaurants, to bring um, uh, new, um, as we were talking, Project Elevate, right? And the potential zoo, and then as well as urbanizing a little bit of the areas that have been, that are not developed yet. So I'm pretty excited to see that. Um, please, anything that you need or any help, don't hesitate to ask. This is why we're here. We're here to serve our community, but we also want to see it grow and thrive. So thank you. appreciate that. Thank you. Council Member Brewer. Great report. Love the acronym for your, for your breweries, wineries, and <laughs> program. Really appreciate that. <laughs> You don't have to pay me for that. Free free promotion. <laughs> I can count on you for that, Councilman. <laughs> and, and I like how the emphasis on improving and beautifying Old Town slash the historic district. I like that idea because there's a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of a lot of business people who want to do business in Old Town are doing business in Old Town, and they're looking for ways to attract other folks to attract their friends who are also entre have that entrepreneurial spirit and want to bring something unique and new to Elk Grove. Um, some of the folks have been, bo have, born, have been born and raised here in Elk Grove doing business in Folsom, doing business in Sacramento, and they're looking for an opportunity to come back. And I know you and Luis have been talking to some of those parties, and some of those parties are going to be making themselves even more forward in the coming days and weeks. And I know you I know you have an open ear and an open door for them. I'm excited for what we're doing because all the programs, all the assistance and incentives that are that you offer through Invest Elk Grove, um, we just have from us, from our standpoint, we just have to be better in promoting those programs on your behalf so you're not the only ones out there doing it. And so with that said, please let us, as Councilmember Robles had mentioned, anything that we can do to help you, please let us know. Because part of our charge, that I feel, is to be a promoter, not just a cheerleader, but a promoter and an active seller of Elk Grove to help the city grow and thrive. Um, Old Town is hungry for that. They have their, and, and obviously from end over end, from Elk Grove Florin to Waterman, um, there's a, there's a look, there's an aesthetic we could still build within the, that framework. It's just making sure that as we continue to bring in new businesses, new restaurants, new unique restaurants, um, that we continue to do our part to give people something new and different so they can continue to come down and enjoy Old Town as they're going to enjoy Project Elevate, as they enjoy the, the casino and everything else that's coming. Um, because one of the things that people have told me to a man and a woman is that they love coming down to Elk Grove and they love hearing about what's happening because they definitely see Elk Grove as becoming not just an entertainment area, but a place, a destination place to live and grow and raise their families. For a lot of folks to retire, they're looking to make that as well. And so it's all coming together and you have all these young entrepreneurs who are stepping up and really doing their part. And, and a lot of businesses who are coming in from different parts of the country. Kubota is a great example of that. Um, people are seeing and realizing that the magic that Slakey Brothers have enjoyed over the years and how a lot of our other businesses have enjoyed over the years um, are just, it, it, it provides something new, something unique, and it's something that we provide. And, and I'm really excited for that. So thank you for doing this report. Thank you for you, Luis and Darren, for your work on this because it really, is, is helping us um, make the city that fun uh, community where people can come, live, 
and, and enjoy and say I'm proud to I'm proud to be an Elk Grovian. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Vice Mayor Spees. Sure. Uh, let's see. So uh, prior to 20, I mean, this is more of a, this is going to be a little bit of a walk down memory lane, Mr. Doan. Prior to 2015, um, we had a number of economic development efforts that didn't quite pan out so well, right? I mean, there were, we, uh, prior to 2015, we had, we went through a couple of iterations with, and you probably, you were, you were on council back in 2015, right? You were, um, I was on planning commission back in 2014. Um, but there were a number of, um, a number of efforts that really hadn't quite worked out. And then in 2015, a young, energetic Daryl Doan came to the city of Elk Grove and young. Young. It was that's uh, eight years ago, so you were twenty. Younger. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, at the time, um, I think it, it was uh, Council Member Hume who said that uh, economic development is a lot like growing an oak tree. You ate from the acorn, and it it takes a while for that oak to grow, but when it grows, it grows strong. Um, a lot of folks will say that economic development is a lot of hand waving and big fluffy ideas and you know talking in big abstractions, right? Um, but I think that just witnessing or just the last two years that that we discussed, uh, I think doesn't really paint the whole picture of where the city has come since 2015. So what I want to do is offer you an opportunity to say you know since 2015, and you're gonna have to go back in the wayback machine here. Since 2015, these were some of the key um, key wins that we had that got us here today. Like I said, it's kind of, we're missing a gap here. So if you could kind of give me a little bit of, uh, what, where we've come in the last eight years. Like right now? Well, yeah, you're putting it uh, it's, a, it's a test. It's a test. <laughs> you're on the spot. <laughs> Do it. It's your report. Card. Um, a, a couple things. Um, you know, when I, when, when I, um, and I'm not, uh, this isn't, Tended to be about me, but I'm gonna talk about myself for a minute. When I when I took this job, um, we were not, and I don't mean this to denigrate anybody who came before me, right. um, because the people before me were more focused on redevelopment than economic development, and those are two totally different things, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we weren't on anybody's <coughs> radar, frankly, um, as a business location, great place mm -hmm. to live, but nobody was thinking about us as a business location. So I mean the key, there's a lot of wins, but I think the biggest win is we we rolled up our sleeves when I got here, when when Jason got here, we came at the same time, uh, nearly the same time. Um, we took stock of what was working and wasn't working. Um, we made some adjustments, and then we just went out and started beating the pavement and that's what economic development is, relationship business. Um, a, a billboard doesn't sell a city, right? Um, an ad in the business journal doesn't sell the city, even though we do pay for those things. But um, what sells the city is um, having a story, articulating that story to everybody who will listen. I spent the first probably three years of this job doing just that. There, there wasn't big, sexy business attraction projects to do. Um, because we had to, we had to articulate our value proposition, and so I think that's the biggest win. We 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 defined that value proposition and went out and told that to anybody who would listen, and we did it in a very grassroots way, right? It was me, Luis, Rachel, while she was here, mm -hmm. um, talking to people out in the community, brokers. We wanted every broker to know about Elk Grove and put us on the top of their list. Every developer, every business, if we got the slightest sniff of a, of a business that had a facility requirement, we were picking up the phone and making those calls. Um, yeah, I, uh, projects aren't coming to me right now. There's been, I mean, Railroad Street, I think, has been, sure. um, you know, that was something I'm really proud of. We, we, the, we the city, we initiated that. In a, in a part of the city that was disinvested and literally buildings were falling down. Mm -hmm. That is the exact most opportune moment for economic development to step in and incentivize the private sector to perform in an area that is disinvested. Um, yeah, I mean, animal shelter, swim center, District 56, the Ridge, um, Kubota, the Zoo, Project Elevate, I mean, there's 
there's been a lot of great, the, the roads we've built, filling potholes, I don't know, there's, I'm rambling. There's no one, there's no one thing except we identified a value proposition and we went out and articulated that to the marketplace. And in uh, 2023, uh, they call us. Mm -hmm. That's been a huge improvement. Now we're in the game. So. Yep. Okay. Well, I just, you know, it's been, it's been nice the last couple of years that when uh, pretty much anywhere I go in the region, and we, I don't say this to gloat for us, um, but Elk Grove is really at a rise here in the, um, in the Sacramento Valley. Um, there was a time when we were the, um, you know, the also ran, right? We were the ones who were, oh, yeah, and there's Elk Grove, right? Um, but I think we're really coming into, into our own, um, and we're performing well in the Valley. And it's, it, the reality, it is very, very difficult for any government to attract businesses in the state of California. When I go to Utah, I see buildings going up constantly, right? Um, but I, what I think is fantastic is that this team, right, all together, um, has performed very, very well. I think the best things are yet to come for Elk Grove. Um, and so with that, I just, I just want to thank you, and I appreciate it. And I'm super looking forward to this workforce development conversation in a minute. So, Me too. Thank you. <laughs> Council Member Sirin. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I know where Council Member Spies was going in his line of questioning. Um, I did so, not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You'll think of something later. He, he I was, should have said this Turned one. out okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, well, but, you know, I'm glad you said Railroad Street because I was going to bring that, that, that up in my comments too because I don't recall you highlighting that in your, in your remarks. Um, first, I just want to thank, I mean, excuse me, congratulate Luis on your promotion. Well-deserved. Well um, of course, you know that it just means more more work coming your way. Yes, <laughs> but um, uh, where, where was I going to start? Well, thank you for the information as well. It's it's a great reminder of how many things or irons we have in the fire, whatever expression you want to use, um, as well as the you know I think the the accomplishments uh, that that you've achieved and the team has thus far. Um, going back to what I was re referring to by Councilmember Spies' comment, or I guess. It's, Previously, Councilmember Hume's comment about uh, the seedling and, and the oak tree, and while I, you know there there is a bit of um, you know circumstances of fate, luck, whatever you want to call it, that can happen in economic development. Um, there is also intentionality, and I think since day one, you know, I think you, uh, me, um, Jason, we all started here on the council at this, these roles, similar at the same time. Since day one, I think you've been very intentional and you know a couple of things that i i remembered when you first came on you know we talked about uh reaching that advertisement and you already mentioned the brokers that you'd reached out to but advertising something simple about advertising in the bay area mm -hmm. uh in the in the first time uh, i saw our city advertise on on the uh, airplane, seeing it in, the, in the, one of the air flight magazines, you know, was, you know, when you came on board and, and, and we saw it in. That was Kristen. Well, thank you, Kristen. Thank you. <laughs> yes. But, but these are the types of things I think, yes, anybody could have done it, but I think, you know, the, this city, this staff, this team um, did it. And, and that's what I'm talking about, the, the intention, talking about the intentionality behind some of these things. And yeah, it doesn't always, it doesn't always stick, but I tell you what, if you never tried it, it's guaranteed uh, never to happen. So we talked about, um, you know, you mentioned Pitch Shell Grove and, you know, the brewery incentives, uh, permit simplicity you mentioned in here too. I mean, these are all innovative uh, things that, uh, you know, um, um, I think had compounding effects over time. And getting back to the Railroad Street project, which, uh, again, very intentional. We, you mentioned going after the P-bit again in Old Town, and I'm glad you did and glad you are doing it, trying it again, because I remember back then um, going after Old Town was uh, meant to incentivize to get people excited about Old Town. And that public-private partnership, and now with the success of Dust Bowl, it's, it's worked. I think everybody, more people are excited about going to Old Town, and I hope 
that as, as you and Councilmember Brewer, when, when you outreach back into Old Town, the business folks, they will recognize the potential there. And, and I hope that the, the PBID this time will be uh, successful because I think there's a lot of potential left uh, to, in, in Old Town to be, to be achieved. So uh, with that, again, just thank you for the information and uh, look forward to continuing the progress on all these great things we have in the works. Thank you, sir. Great comments Thanks. here from my colleagues. Um, oh. you, it's my turn. <laughs> I almost walked away. <laughs> I feel like this is going on way too long. No. Well, you know, this is the, this is the time we get to pr uh, allow for praise and just a tremendous job with our economic development team, everyone. I'm a proud mayor. When I, when I go to various boards and commissions, my colleagues are always talking about how great Elk Grove is. And these are leaders from other cities that Elk Grove is thriving. And as a 30 year resident, I've seen all of those changes take place. And we are at that pivotal point where you know we have achieved so much greatness in such a short amount of time. And there's so many great things coming um, that are on the horizon. So I'm just very excited. I know that you know when I talk to constituents throughout the city, this is this is where they want to live, work, shop, and play, and it's the economic development department and all of our other departments that when we all work together as a team, we dream big and the sky's the limit. So I'm just proud of all the work that everyone's doing. I love what you said about strong economies make strong communities. Absolutely agree. There there are so many things to celebrate, and I love what's happening in Old Town, because as someone who's lived here 30 years, um, I've seen the sadness in uh, all of you know the properties that were in disarray, and now it's becoming a destination place. And that's quite remarkable, it's intentional. And that's exciting because it puts that part of our community on the map and brings in more revenue and jobs um, to our historic, historic district. Ah, you're getting it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like know if it. we can rename Old Town Plaza then. I don't know how that would work, but ne neither here nor there. You're going to get me in trouble. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but there's, uh, there's, you know, there's great projects coming to fruition, and uh, I look forward to working with you and our team as we develop um, our Project Elevate and, of course, the potential future zoo. These are transformational projects for our city and truly make Elk Grove a destination city. So the, the little city that once upon a time that I moved to back in 92, uh, so many great things happening. So just congratulations to everybody. Um, just real proud to be the mayor of this amazing city. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, we will transition to our next item. That's to receive information on workforce development training programs and consider a resolution to execute a contract with CyberProud Inc. to provide workforce development training services to Elk Grove residents. Mouse. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. I'm Luis Aguilar, your Economic Development Program Manager. And tonight we're going to be talking about the Workforce Development Programs. The recommendation tonight is to receive information on the Workforce Development Programs and, and consider resolution authorizing the City Manager to execute a contract with CyberProud to provide workforce development training services in the fields of information technology and cybersecurity in the amount not to exceed 353,158. I'll start by providing you with some background information. Um, the city in 2021 re received an allocation for the American Rescue Act uh, funds, and the city gathered input from residents via survey, as well as through the work of the city's COVID-19 recovery task force, which identifies several initiatives to uh, provide uh, funding, including workforce development. In August 2021, the City Council adopted an ARPA expenditure plan, which included $2 million for workforce development programs intended to upskill and reemploy Elk Grove residents who were uh, impacted by the pandemic. And in June 2022, the City issued a formal request for proposals to, identifi to identify and select the programs to train and place Elk Grove residents in industries in need of um, trained workers. The RFP focused on three areas, healthcare, information technology, and manufacturing. The RFP resulted in a submission of eight proposals, one in healthcare, five in information technology, one in manufacturing, and one covered all three. There was a selection committee made up of three staff members who evaluated the proposals and 
uh, recommended to move forward with two of the proposals. One, with the Sacramento Unified School District's Charles A. Jones Center for Manufacturing Training Services, and the other one, CyberProud, for the information technology. So I'm gonna provide you with a little bit of information on each serv service providers. Um, the Sacramento Unified School District's Charles A. Jones Center is a nationally accredited adult school and uh, offering services since 1967. In 2020, they launched the Charles A. Jones Center uh, Manufacturing Pre-Apprentice -pre uh, Program with CareX funding from the city of Sacramento. And uh, one of the key partners was the uh, Sacramento Valley Manufacturing Alliance, which uh, was formed by local manufacturing employers who were looking to address the growing needs for uh, the demand and, and skilled manufacturing uh, workers. The, the, the proposed program will, will provide training and certifications for up to 120 Elk Grove residents uh, in the following component courses. Introduction to manufacturing for 20 participants, welding fabrication for 10 participants, and manufacturing technician for 10 participants, and they'll offer uh, 50 forklift cert certifications. This contract will be brought back to you as early as the next council meeting. Um, it was going through the proper uh, school board uh, approval uh, process, and so uh, we'll, we'll bring that back to you. Uh, CyberProud, the contract that, that, you, uh, that you see tonight, um, uh, CyberProud is the Sacramento-based nonprofit organization that provides technical training and industry certification services in the field of information technology, specifically cybersecurity. Um, they're also one of the recipients of the CARES Act funding from the city of uh, Sacramento. And uh, through that, they were able to offer services for 70 residents. Uh, their key partner, training partner, is Apprentice Now, a national, national provider of registered apprenticeships and customized training to hire programs. Uh, so they offer the training. Uh, the proposed program will serve 40 Elk Grove residents. Um, these residents will complete a compre comprehensive pre-apprenticeship program they will also uh, complete an industry-recognized CompTA, which is the Computing Technology Industry Association certification, uh, some career development and, and, and job placement services. Um, and these programs will be offered in two tracks, IT infrastructure for support for 20 participants and also a more advanced um, certification in cybersecurity for an initial 20 participants. The cyber proud contract will include the following terms, design and implement the program, market to Elk Grove residents and businesses, conduct intake and enrollment of these participants, enroll the businesses to accept program graduates, so creating that pipeline, uh, provide course instruction and exam preparation, and uh, place the graduates and, and track them and, and, and provide uh, retention bonuses once they stay within um, their uh, their job. They will also be providing quarterly, report, quarterly reports to the city, and the contract is for a term of 24 months. In summary, the recommendation is to adopt the resolution authorizing the city manager to execute the contract with CyberProud Inc. to provide the training services in the amount not to exceed 353,158. In terms of the fiscal impact, both the CyberProud and the Charles A. Jones contract will be um, will not exceed the $2 million allocation that was uh, uh, directed by council, and so there's enough budget in, in the next fiscal year. This, this fiscal year, um, as alternative actions, council could decline to approve the contract um, in the form presented, uh, direct staff to modify the contract as needed, or direct staff to solicit new proposals and, and get different service providers. So that was the short presentation, but I'm happy to take any questions. And I also do have representatives from both organizations here uh, to answer any specific questions to their program. Excellent. Thank you. All right. At this time, I'll go ahead and open up the public comment opportunity. Seeing nobody signed up to speak, I'll close the public comment opportunity. Uh, Mr. Aguilar, I just have actually just one quick question. Um, I support, I think this is a great project in uh, workforce development, and so I have no questions. Uh, with any other contract. Just out of curiosity, um, and I had raised it with our city manager, do we know why Elk Grove Unified School District, either did they not respond to the RFP request so, so, or do, do they not have a qualifying program? Yeah, so so both. Um, so prior to uh, issuing the RFP, we had 
a communication with, with the Elk Grove Unified School District. That was our first initial mm-hmm. thought. We want to work with our school district. Okay. We would love to. And so they did have, uh, they do have a healthcare program. Yeah. And unfortunately, they didn't apply for that. Um, so, uh, but we're more than happy to re-engage with them if that's what council desires. And, and you know, given that there's additional funding, we could sure. potentially do that. But they do, they are one of the um, centers that, uh, that test for, uh, do the certifications for healthcare. Um, mm-hmm. And but they are also a partner with the Charles A. Jones Center, yes. so and they're going to be working together uh, to make sure that any um, residents that come through that center or the adult education school can um, t- take advantage of these uh, services. But yeah, Thank we you. did reach out to them, and um, unfortunately, they didn't submit a proposal. No, and I just wanted to ask that just for the record because you know, yeah, someone you know, if we have the large, you know, the largest school mm-hmm. district in Northern California in our backyard. Um, so I just wanted yeah. to make sure we got that clarification. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, I will start to my left this time and uh, council member soon. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Luis, for, for that presentation. Um, I, I'm excited about this. I think this is, this is fantastic to uh, be able to prepare our, our students and residents for uh, not just today's workforce, but tomorrow's workforce as well. Um, cybersecurity is a, definitely a growing industry and I think you're going to have to include a final test for Vice Mayor Spies over here to make sure <laughs> these folks are trained appropriately. I write that test. <laughs> you write that test, exactly. No, anyway, for all kidding aside, again, thank you very much. Look forward to this opportunity and uh, wholeheartedly support this as well. Thank you, Mayor. Vice Mayor. All right. I've been bubbling in my seat uh, all I all, know you have. I've been, I've been <laughs> chomping and chawing at the bit. You know this was going to. This is going to happen. So you guys got to bear with me a little bit here. I did I did write this down because I, I, I do want to stay on topic about this. But first, uh, one of the questions I did have was uh, relative to the manufacturing. You know, if one of the components covered in the welding is laser welding or is it what type of is it like the, tr- the traditional welding or. He's actually the instructor. So. OK. All right. I, ha- I haven't welded before. No, that's not me. No. Uh, we're currently covering the processes that are most uh, popular for precision welding in this area, mm-hmm. which is uh, MIG, TIG, and uh, um, electrode welding. Okay. Uh, laser welding is a, is a um, computer numerical control process, um, so it's not something the individual uh, performs the welding. Okay. Uh, we do have laser cutting equipment, plasma uh, cutting equipment, um, and uh, the programming aspects of it are almost identical to laser um, equipment. Okay, so. and then that's all part of that one component of the uh, the welding. Um, so we have um, we have different length programs that we've perso- proposed. Um, the um, manufacturing technician program is a eight month program, <laughs> and it includes all of the component other components that are. Uh, offered as individual options. So we have things as short as the uh, forklift class, which is a single day, to the welding one class, which is um, a three-week class for 90 hours. Mm -hmm. Uh, But if an individual enrolls in the technician program, they're actually going to get close to 300 hours of welding time using different processes and the fabrication techniques that go along with that. So okay. I'm not sure if that nope, I'm directly good. answers your question. Nope, it, I'm good. <laughs> okay, yep. great. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, and then the second um, question I have before I get to the cybersecurity piece, um, and maybe it would be a question for both schools or something we can talk about for next time, is um, often there are ancillary fees in life that keep people from taking advantage of these programs. Sometimes it's health care, or not health care, excuse me, child care. Other times it could be transportation. I would assume in, in this environment we probably don't have transportation issues. Um, but did we set aside or can we set aside or let's think about um, perhaps using some of the, some of the remaining funds um, to try to get to those, uh, some, some would call it a UBI, right, a universal basic income, right? Um, but something that would help offset um, those um, some of those fees that would cause a uh, you know a, a roadblock right um, and maybe that's something to discuss for next time but 
Well, the, the manufacturing program does include a, um, a tra transit voucher. Okay. So there, there's that built in because the um, the center is in on Lemon, Lemon Hill, so South Sacramento, okay. and so for Elgro residents to get there, they they would have a monthly voucher for transportation. Okay. And um, the other question, um, we did uh, discuss having some sort of like um, stipend. Right. Um, some of the feedback uh, initially was that when all these programs were kind of, when there was multiple programs, right. people would sign up just to get the voucher. And sure. so that was a disincentive um, because they wouldn't complete the, the program. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's something that we can certainly add if, if right. we need to. Right. Um, to ensure that someone, you know, especially for the longer term programs that are, you know, a few right. months. Okay. And I, I mean, I would assume we can, obviously we can't talk about it tonight, but maybe if there's agreement, maybe we could ask that you'd bring something back next time to discuss. Is that within bounds? Getting blank stares. <laughs> well, it's it's fair game to talk about tonight. It's this oh, is it's, generally part of the project. So if the, if the okay, council well, I, I guess wants the challenge is to, I don't know what those would be. Right, you right. I would, you know, I, I can, I know that childcare is often a stumbling block to doing some of these types of things. Transportation being another, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to guess that you're with Cyber. Yeah, I'm. Yeah. I'm Coley Moorhead. Right. I'm CEO, founder of Cyber Proud. Um, thank you for the opportunity um, to address your question about um, additional support services. We have typically worked through um, SETA, Sacramento Employment Training Agency, and what we do typically with all recipients for any of the programs, and I know this is true with Charles A. Jones as well, is that you can evaluate um, the eligibility for that recipient of the services under, let's say, a WIOA designation. And there are additional support services that would be available. And they do include transportation, um, daycare, and some of those other um, you know, life uh, type supporting services. So the idea is that if there's an issue around daycare or transportation, for instance, that would preclude someone from enrolling in the program, what we do is try to make our best effort to um, provide access to those other services and leverage those other funds. Um, and so the, even in this uh, arrangement, it would center. be available through SETA to do? It would, yeah. So okay. we evaluate the eligibility of each sure. recipient to see if they are eligible for other funding through other sources. So basically this idea of braiding funding sure. to provide um, sort of a more holistic approach in serving that that person. Hopefully that okay. All right. Well, then, then, then I'll let it be because it sounds like there's other opportunities. I just, I just want to be sure that for as much as we possibly can, that we remove all barriers, whether it's, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, whatever those barriers are. I, you know, I'd love to use that extra money to be able to do that. If it's already taken care of, then I'll, then we can find other, <laughs> other things to to use it for. So, um, I guess the one thing I would say is that. We evaluate that that eligibility, um, but not every recipient of the program is eligible for those funds. Okay. So again, we're trying to make our best efforts. Okay, mm -hmm. got it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so all right. So um, Mr. Aguilar, I want I want to thank you for working on this. I've been waiting rather impatiently since I brought this up as a proposal um, a while back. Um, I, I want to. I want. I want to be certain. I'm really glad that we can um, have a significant a, uh, impact with the ARPA funds uh, where it means the most, right? Directly to our Elk Grove residents. I mean, this is. I mean, we we have stuff. We've had stuff for the businesses. We've had stuff where we can, you know, uh, improve infrastructure. We've had all kinds of things. But this is the first one that is going directly to our residents, the tax-paying people, the people who lost their jobs in the middle of the pandemic. Um, they were underemployed, unemployed. And I'm thrilled that we're finally able to get this going for them. The unfortunate reality is that COVID didn't impact everybody equally, right? Um, many, many industries like information technology and cybersecurity actually performed better, right? Um, so while there's some, I, I, cert I, I personally don't know of a single information technology or cybersecurity person um, that lost their job during COVID. I don't know of a single one of them. And I know a few people in cybersecurity. Um, so when I recommended this for consideration, um, I was very interested in using the ARPA funds uh, where it would be most impactful. And uh, so six months ago, 
and I'm going to read this off of here because I want to make sure that I get this right. Fortune magazine wrote, the need for cybersecurity professionals has been growing rapidly, even faster than companies can hire, and that demand is expected to continue. The number of unfilled cybersecurity jobs worldwide grew 350% between 2013 and 2021, from 1 million to 3.5 million. In the United States, there are about 1 million cybersecurity workers, but there are around 715,000 715, jobs yet to be filled. And that further, there aren't enough professionals who have the credentials necessary, whether it's a master's degree in cybersecurity or other certificate programs like what we're proposing, uh, to get hired. Um, I've been a cybersecurity professional for the better part of 30 years. Um, it was actually even before we recognized cybersecurity as cybersecurity. It wasn't even computer security. It was, it was just computers, right? Um, Angela, and I'm sure many of you know that Angela and I uh, own a, a cybersecurity company that specializes in Department of Defense cybersecurity. My single greatest barrier to getting more work is talent. There is a complete and total lack of talent that's available in the labor market. We spend a significant amount of time to recruit and maintain a workforce capable of, uh, capable of performing important work in the defense of our nation. I spent all day today on phone looking for different people with the certifications that I need. It is that much in demand, and I say that with zero exaggeration. It's investments like these that bridge our residents to well-paying, satisfying careers. And a Security Plus certification is a fantastic gateway to success in that cybersecurity industry. No exaggeration. And this other point, while it's slightly off topic, I'm sure many of you will know, will remember the times that we brought them here, um, Elk Grove is really building itself a reputation for cyber. Elk Grove Unified School District is one of 18 cyber patriot centers of excellence in the, in the states. For the last two years, Toby Johnson Middle School was second in the nation, and they're going back to DC again this year to compete in the nationals. And they're a feeder school to Franklin. Franklin High School was the national champion runner up in 2022. And they are also going back to DC again this year to compete. And 2021 and 2022, Madam Mayor, I'm sure you'll remember that uh, Franklin High School also brought home the NorCal Cyber Mayor's Cup to Elk Grove. In my office. All right. <laughs> so, you know, my point in all of this, and I, and I know I, 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 I'm, I have, I have uh, time in the bank from times when I haven't spoken on other issues, um, so I'm going to use it tonight, but um, I'm really glad that we're using the ARPA funds for this purpose. It provides our residents a pathway to a rewarding career in cybersecurity and information technology. And my hope is that we work really, really hard to get to the communities and to the people who, you know, who lost their um, jobs during the, uh, the pandemic. And most specifically to those um, with an eye for um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've really got to reach out to all of the different smaller, um, well, I don't know exactly how you call it, but we really need to work on the diversity as as aspect on this one. So obviously, I'm sorry, I'm brimming with excitement. Uh, Luis, man, I can't wait for you to get started. I'm looking forward to seeing this um, really be um, something that, that we can be proud of. I'm looking at um, seeing 40 new more. IT slash cybersecurity people. I'm hoping that next year you come back and say, I want more money mm -hmm. um, because this, this is really where it helps um, people raise their bar. And so with that, thank you for putting up with my excitement. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> That'll be a tough act to follow, but go ahead, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, it will. Um, no, I totally share Vice Mayor Spies' passion on this issue because as we're looking to close the, the, the cyber gap um, and, and create new people for the workforce, especially in the information technology field, this is really good news and this is very exciting. And I'm very pleased to see that um, Dr. Moorhead share, came to us tonight to share some of those details of what CyberProud does because it helps draws the nexus to where we want to go as a city 
that has that reputation in cyber. And Vice Mayor Spies and I, we've known each other for a lot of years and we've talked geek on this subject. And I really, I really am very happy and excited to see the potential of what we can do with this because we know we have the talent here. And then with the project being specific towards um, training Elk Grove residents, Elk Grove youth, Elk Grove adults into a, a, into a career, a good jobs paying career um, in high technology, information technology, that's a plus. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna go any further because Kevin stole all my th thunder. <laughs> but thank you for the presentation. Um, again, thank you Dr. Moorhead for being here. I really appreciate that because this is, this is the type of healthy discussions that we should have when it comes to building our building our, our, our base in our city and, and our workforce. Council Member Robles. Thank you, um, Luis, for presenting today. Uh, this is something near and dear to my heart. Education is just near and dear to my heart. Anything that we can do to advance um, our residents, advance young people, advance um, people who for nothing of their fault, you know, lost their jobs during, during a, a horrible pandemic. Um, I'm super supportive and super excited. And Kevin, thank you for sharing, um, you know, the fact that there needs to be more diversity in cybersecurity that needs to be shared and that definitely you know um i sense your passion up here i'm all for it so you know anything that we can do to help out uh i'm just kind of curious on the level of security what what's this like is it secret top secret or is it different type of security clearance that they get oh, i'm sorry i'll let her answer it because i don't know actually you know i god i know this is going to sound crazy but our our emphasis, at least for me, is that um, that we're providing them access to the training. And to your point, is that um, when we first started this work um, during the middle of COVID, and we we presented this opportunity for individuals who had lost their job and been pushed out of the economy, who had you know a decade of work experience, but then they saw the economy change, and they're like, "Where do I fit now?" And so our emphasis has really been on Part of it is the certification. The other part of it is, is really um, understanding the landscape of the, of the industry and how to better position them into any type of role. So I know you talked a little bit, you know, when we talk about defense industry and specific to cybersecurity, however, it's impacting education, healthcare, local government. We've seen, when you think about the risks that are involved in all the different sectors, we've really tried to shift the mindset about what technology is. The other thing is to getting people to see themselves working in technology, that it's not just for individuals who have a four-year or a six-year degree or people who can do calculus. I mean, that's the other thing is the certifications and the pre-apprenticeship training that we do opens doors for individuals who didn't see themselves in technology. And that's key, and that's the difference that we try to, we really try to project. The other thing is, um, the linkage to the mentors. So our mentors, and I love listening about small business and entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship here, is that the other thing is the shift into what is the you know, uh, MSPs or management service providers. What we're hearing from um, you know, your larger corporations is they want a team to come in and do work for them. And so the opportunity for these young people to also learn about how do you become an entrepreneur? How do you start a business and work in technology? And that's where we really see sort of the untapped potential is not necessarily um, individuals, you know, doing a direct hire to a large company, but how do you build a business, right? And so that's that's another really exciting part of what we've learned. So I didn't answer the question, but <laughs> no, give no you worries. more to think about. <laughs> yeah, well, but I can, I can also help you with the answer to that question. So you're, you, you might be mixing certifications okay. with clearances. So for instance, I, think, I believe with this program, it is the CompTIA A plus for the IT professionals and mm -hmm. the security plus for mm -hmm. the cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about clearances, which is really important to me, if, if you can get people who have A plus, or uh, <laughs> security plus and clearances, mm -hmm. we need to talk. But yeah. um, it's it, that's when it's secret yeah. Top secret, et cetera. So okay. what they're doing is uh, the certificates, certifications. Mm -hmm. it, we, and just we did add in uh, Network Plus certification to this. And the reason why is because that's another thing we've, we're, we've heard um, mm -hmm. infrastructure support is the 
you know, the designing, the building, the maintaining mm -hmm. of those systems, then you think about security, securing those systems. And so there's there are multiple different opportunities, and especially when you think about entry level, the A plus and the network plus mm -hmm. are really opening up doors mm -hmm. for these entry level right. um, positions. Anyway, right. thank you. Thank, and, th thank and, you for, oh, yeah. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, one, one last thing relative to that is that for the type of work that I do on the daily, the, the opening certification that people must have to get in the door is security plus. Okay. And I mean, obviously, well, we don't employ here in California only because our work is somewhere else. Um, but you know, the type of work that we do entry level positions in Utah are $65,000, $70,000 a year. Yeah. That's not bad, right? For just breaking in. So I think it's, I think it's fantastic. I'm thrilled. And I've already said that five times, so. I'll lend my comments. No, I'll lend my comments for you guys. <laughs> I guess, I guess we're, we're all smart individuals here. Um, we're all geeks when it comes to technology and yeah. security. Um, but just wanted to say again, thank you. Uh, I'm excited to see this project and also for workforce development. Um, I grew up in the Midwest. Um, I saw, you know, I learned a little bit about welding. Wasn't the best welder, but learned a little bit about it. And I know that that's something right now that our economic, um, our workforce development is definitely in need, especially with construction and all that. So thank you for that. Vice Mayor, would you like to make the motion? Oh, didn't you have comments? I did in the very beginning. Oh, did you? I'm sorry. I talked so long that I uh, <laughs> I would like to uh, move this item, please. Yes. Can I get a second? Second. Excellent. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aguilar. OK, how many of the rest of you fell asleep when I was going on? About that? <laughs> Next item, please. You like Take item 9.4. <laughs> Cybersecurity is kind of cool. To receive an update on legislation passed in 2022. Did you hear the one they're trying to end cybersecurity? The bill? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Crystal Love Lazard. I am your Community Engagement and Government Relations Manager. So. Okay. Um, of the thousands of bills that were introduced in 2022, Governor Newsom signed 997 into law, and this presentation is going to very quickly cover just a few of them. Okay, as you know, our team tracks and engages on proposed legislative bills, looking out for the best interests of Elk Grove residents. We use the city's legislative principles, a, documented, a document updated every two years, to guide the decisions that we make. And Mayor, I appreciated the comment you made about Assembly Bill 333, and um, that legislative bill does align with our goals. And as you know, the city has already submitted a letter of support. So we're an active program. OK, these are the major themes we saw during the 2022 legislative season. I'm sure none of these are a surprise to any of you. I want to start this update with these two bills. Um, these bills were meant to address California's affordable, ho affordable housing crisis, you know, what Daryl mentioned earlier. Um, the first one is the, in regards to housing and commercial zones, Affordable Housing and Roads Job Act, or what we call AB 2011, we did oppose, as you know, because it, takes away an element of local decision making. Um, this bill was passed and it creates a ministerial streamlined approval process for two types of projects that you see here. The other bill that we're gonna talk about early that's really critical to understand is the Middle Class Housing Act, SB6, and it establishes housing as an allowable use on any parcel zoned for office or retail uses. Those are significant changes. Both of these bills address labor standards, requiring that developers pay laborers, laborers a general prevailing wage. They both do that. And finally, I wanna note the affordability requirements listed here under the Affordable Housing and Road Jobs Act. You see them here listed on this slide. The Middle Class Housing Act does not add any new affordability requirements. However, existing affordability standards still apply that we saw like an SB 35. Oh, this is me not advancing the slides, I apologize. Okay, 
AB 2234 is meant to make the post-entitlement permitting process easier to understand and faster. And this also gets to the need for more housing. This is part of that. We need more housing built. Um, under this new law, public agencies must publish formal application checklists for post-entitlement housing development permits, as well as examples to complete applications for specific types of housing developments. Local agencies must also respond within 15 days after an agency received an application by identifying any specific information from the published checklist that was missing from the application or else the application becomes deemed complete. So these are the, there's a whole process to expedite this. And this is something I'm sure our, our planners will be taking a close look at moving forward. Okay. Dozens of climate-related bills were signed into law by the governor in 2022. Some were part of a long-range plan that charts the course for a future less dependent on fossil fuels. AB 1279 sets a goal of California becoming carbon neutral by 2045. SB 1020 requir requires the state's electric grid to be powered by renewable energy. These are really lofty, significant goals. Simply put, Net zero refers to the balance between the amount of greenhouse gases produced and the amount removed from the atmosphere. We reach net zero when the amount we add is no more than the amount we take out. In an effort to reduce pollution and tackle climate change, Governor Newsom signed the Plastic Pollution Prevention and Packaging Producer Responsibility Act, which is quite a mouthful. But this is a very significant bill. It requires all packaging in the state to be recyclable or compostable by 2032. This is Cali so California's SB 54 is one of the most significant bills in regards to plastic recyclables. These uh, percentages that you see here on the slide are very ambitious compared to where we're at as a state, which is not this. Okay. SB 1383, which you're very familiar with, requires every city to produce a specific amount of compost, mulch, or renewable natural gas from anaerobic digestion to develop a California-specific market for such material. Many cities, including ours, are not ready for this part of this law. So AB 1985 gives cities an additional two years to fully implement this part of 1383. This was kind. OK. AB 1909 makes four changes that will impact bicyclists. Perhaps the most consequential is requiring drivers to change lanes whenever passing a bicyclist, if feasible. The prior rule required people in cars to give people on bikes a three-foot margin when passing. But that was difficult to enforce and wasn't enough space for some bicyclists. So this was a significant package of bills for cyclists. AB 2147 is pretty clear. Jaywalking is now allowed under safe conditions. <laughs> Simple. OK, this is one we're really proud of. Um, as you know, catalytic converter theft is a huge concern across many cities in our state. Elk Grove was proud to support these bills. And these are going to be very impactful um, and make it more difficult for thieves to find a marketplace for their stolen catalytic converter parts. So this was a win. As you know, the city of Elk Grove currently has an ordinance prohibiting cannabis sales within our city. However, under SB 1186, this new Municipal Cannabis Patients Right of Access Act, um, cities will need to allow for the delivery of municipal cannabis. So we will be doing an updated ordinance, which you will see. OK. As our city clerk, I'm sure, has witnessed, and all of you as well, over the past several years, our whole state has witnessed uh, a less civil public meeting process post-COVID. Um, so this new law, SB 1100, outlines a new process. So it sort of codifies in, in the bill language um, this process that a presiding member of a Brown Act legislative body can conduct so this is not new to us, per se, because as you see at the bottom of this slide, this language has already been effect here in Elk Grove. But now it's, 
it's codified in law because this is a lack of civility in, in public meetings is of great concern, right, in our democratic process. If, uh, yeah, I, I assume it would. <laughs> I don't see it, not. Okay, real quick. Um, legislators. <laughs> disclosure of public records related to agenda items. This is another one that's important for the clerks. Um, AB 2647 slightly modifies the Brown Act requirements for the disclosure of public records related to agenda items. This is, again, something that we're supporting. And finally, I did want to note a statewide proposition that was a really significant pass. So Proposition 31 passed as well, and it upholds Senate Bill 793. And so in this proposition, basically this covers uh, a broad range of flavored tobacco products, including cigarettes, chewing tobacco, snuff, cigars, e-cigarettes, roll your own tobacco. So this is a big significant upholding of a previous law that California had passed. So the voters agreed. And finally, just because you can't forget locals, I wanted to do a nod to a few local election results. Measure A, you're all aware, failed. That would have funded regional transportation improvements. Um, measure D did pass. It allows the county of Sacramento and cities within the county, including us, to develop housing for low-income people and families equal to 1% of current housing units in the county. And then you're all very aware that Measure E, our local sales tax measure, also passed. I'll take any questions. Thank you for that um, excellent report. Um, so question, will this report be more intended towards the end of a legislative session? So this report is in reflection of what was passed right. last, yeah, in 2022. So, so will we be able to get a list of things? I know I see them, but maybe my colleagues don't get the privy of seeing some of the bills that we are following and taking positions on. So it would be helpful, I think, to be able to share that when those take place so that they're aware. Um, and if there's any advocacy uh, opportunities, because a number of us know legislators outside of our own you know, uh, districts, if you will, um, I think that would be helpful um, to share that information of the bills that we are following. Yes, of course. I mean, um, so I'm relatively newish to this yeah. position as we, let's say, um, reimagine our legislative affairs staffing direction. But I, yeah, I would love well, I think the it's support. Great. Um, We've needed this position, so um, I think you're doing a great job. Thank you. And I, yeah, and the things that we're following on the state level, but on the federal level as well. So all of those are important efforts. But may, you know, and I don't know how often we need those, but I would imagine as bills are being introduced, as, when we're taking positions, I would just put it in some sort of communication as an FYI, mm -hmm. just so that um, they're Everyone aware knows. of what's also taking place, like the vehicle uh, abatement bill. Um, on the flavor ban, on the enforcement side of things, do we have the resources to, or, and have we been going out and doing some visits to see who's complying? It's funny that you asked me that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, our staff has been working with um, code enforcement, uh -huh. uh, and they have developed and are working on a plan for that for our city. Um, and uh, I was going to pull it up real quick, cause if I can find it really quick. Do you know exactly off the top of your head? I know our staff is working on a education first letter. Yeah. That has gone out to all the uh, retailers, retailers that have um, license. So we're working with them on defining those products and getting those off the shelves and how they can get refunds. And then yeah. uh, we'll create beats within the city for our code enforcement officers to do periodic checks, probably annually or semi-annually. And that's the biggest um, issues that I'm seeing following this issue statewide is the lack of consistency mm -hmm. from jurisdictions, not every jurisdiction having the enforcement mechanism mm -hmm. to actually enforce the law, which is really the intent. Um, not to just pass it, uh, so it's to, it's to get these flavors off the street. So, and you know that that I'd be curious. So as you get more information, uh, you know, um, I, I appreciate that we're doing the educational route. Um, although I do believe that we're definitely, you know, I think from the industry side, there's a lot of education going out, but the it's that disconnect with the enforcement side of things. 
Um, so, and I so will forward starting. you, sorry, uh, Mayor, I will forward you, I'll share the yeah. email that we're, we've been working on with our code enforcement teams. I think our approach initially is going to be education so that everybody can get on board with what our city expects from them. Yeah. And then we will go and follow up with our enforcement aspect of it, uh, making sure that they've had enough time to uh, follow the rules and regulations yeah. that have been set forth. Uh, but it will give us a chance to also educate everybody in our community and not um, you know, single out any particular business. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe their dead, a deadline for products was like December 22nd, 23rd, something like that. Um, and there's not general awareness of like the, even the products because there's so many out there and not all are flavor. And there are um, a few exceptions. And there's a few yeah. exceptions, exactly. So um, I, but I know that uh, the city of Sacramento and some of the counties and other cities, there, there's more like some undercover sting operations and things like that going on. Um, that I've been reading about. So I was just curious how we were doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions from my colleagues? I'll go to the left. No? No. Good. But we also, I know you've been here for a while, but I want to echo the mayor's sentiments. It's, it's glad to see you in this spot, and you are doing it. We're hearing great things about you. So thank you. Thank you. To the right, Councilmember Brewer, go ahead. No, great report, Crystal. And in, in regards to the old um, adage, it's like stuff that you used to do years ago, it seems to come back and creep back on you. So if you need someone to go undercover, like I used to do in my old days with the Yellow County DA's office, <laughs> I can shave this beard off a little bit more and look a little bit more younger if you need me. So. Undercover in high school. <laughs> that could like be like a reality show. I don't it's know. Like, it's it sounds like bad. 21 Jump Street all over again. <laughs> But I, but but I will but I will say this, Crystal. I I like this report in retrospect of 2022 because it definitely gives us as a council um, eyes on what has passed and what's on the way going through the process. Um, and obviously, you know, you have many resources through our contract lobbyists, Gonzalez and Sons, and through the League of California Cities. Um, but I love this information because it, it definitely speaks to all the key items that I was following over the course of the year and what the mayor was c covering over the course of the year in our in our day daytime capacities. But um, but I really like this because when you because when you go through the bill introductions at, mm -hmm. at like just past this past Friday, mm -hmm. we saw 565 bills passed on Friday and people try and make sense of what's real, what's not, and you see a lot of intent bills, a lot of spot bills, and you really have to pay close attention until mar mid-March mm -hmm. to figure out uh, what's real and what's not. And then uh, in addition to the 565, there were an additional 1,200 that right. passed before then. So um, just to have eyes on what's going on and what our priorities are and how we can be advocates for, for our constituents is value added, so thank you so much. If I could add, uh, so we are taking a more proactive approach with this new position, mm -hmm. and we've been working closely mm -hmm. with Assembly Member Wynn's Good. Uh, legislative director, Emily Berry, to help advise them while she's crafting a anti-housing discrimination bill. So our housing um, services manager has been very implemental in that, so Sarah's been great. So yeah, we are trying to be more proactive, and if you have priorities or questions or concerns, yeah, let's... You know, I can come talk about things whenever. No, Do we like, have that same no, relationship like that. with Senator Ashby? Senator Ashby. I've, we've met them. We ha we don't have it as deep, but okay. I do understand yeah. that you have a close relationship. So we are looking forward to building that from a staff perspective as well. Okay, great. I'll be happy to facilitate and set up something. Thank you. And, and in addition to what we're looking on the state level, there's things going on, on the federal level too. And so uh, that gives you that extra dimension and having that extra outlet with the uh, Congressmember Barra, Congressmember Matsui, even Congressmember Garamendi, mm -hmm. who's even offered to uh, to provide assistance mm -hmm. for the city as well. So we have a lot of hands in a lot of different places, but it makes us stronger as a city when we have um, when we have a set of eyes and ears in house oh, I to keep us going agree. in real time. We had a very successful meeting yesterday with yeah. Congresswoman Matsui, awesome. where we shared our priority projects, including things that could be earmarks, and then just things we really wanted her to know about and be excited about. So great. It's a, deepening relationship as well. Thank you a lot. This yeah. is this is good thank information you. and good stuff. Councilmember Robles. Well, thank you for the presentation. I'm excited to see that, um, you know, you've been in the community a lot lately, um, doing workshops and 
you know, the feedback that I'm getting is that people are now starting to feel like the city's paying attention, and that means something. Um, so please keep on utilizing um, District 56. Uh, I'm a little biased because it is in my district. Oh, but. no, 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 don't start. <laughs> what is it about but, District 4, like the representatives? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sitting. <laughs> so please keep on using I'm just kidding. But um, but thank you for the update. So and I think like everybody else said, um, you know, you please utilize we're here. Um, we all know different folks in different areas where we can always be great advocates for our city, and that's exactly what we want to do. So thank you. Thank you. Excellent report. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up, our council comments, reports, future agenda items. I'll start to the right. Anything to report? Uh, nothing to report. Council Member Brewer. Um, council Vice Mayor Spies and I have the Library Commission board meeting tomorrow at 3 o'clock at um, the County Administration Office building, but we also have the satellite capabilities that we can use here in town as well. And so just wanted to report that as an extra. Thank you. Um, Vice Mayor, or we'll go to Council Member soon because I think the Vice Mayor looks like he's prepared to say something. I got a little stuff. bit. All right, so yeah. we'll go with Okay, you. very quickly, we uh, uh, sewer district meeting was canceled. I mean, this month was canceled. And then uh, SACOG board meeting uh, last, last week. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Okay, thanks. Um, so I do want to um, mention that yesterday uh, I had the opportunity to meet with Congresswoman uh, Doris Matsui. Uh, a lot of the people who are in the room today were in the room yesterday. Uh, we had the opportunity to talk about priority projects uh, for Elk Grove, some of them being you know, the, the White Lock Interchange at 99, uh, zero emissions vehicles, uh, the Elk Grove uh, Domestic Violence Prevention Program, and another item that's a bit of a follow-up to a previous thing that we discussed before is the Community and Railway Safety Program. Um, Congressman or Congresswoman Matsui um, offered to uh, reinvigorate uh, some conversation with uh, Union Pacific Railroad, and so we were certainly uh, happy to have her uh, in that conversation. Um, I don't. I, UPRR has not been unresponsive, but there has been some. Um, personnel changes. So we're absolutely happy to have her engage. Uh, the mayor and I had the opportunity to uh, do a CSD two by two. We had conversations uh, relative to uh, Measure E. And the last I have is an ask from a resident named Russell Rogers. He's actually from outside of District 3. He's in District 2. I asked him if he would follow up with you, Council Member um, Councilmember Brewer, um, but his ask is uh, what he told me was that his um, when his wife had had a heart attack, they used the Camden Lake Trail as their rehabilitation as well as other parts of uh, I forget the trail specific trail name over in District Four. Um, but what he had said was, you know, they did a lot of walking, but the challenge was that um, there were access issues. If you're not at the corner or particularly at the crosswalk, um, then th there was a lack of access. Um, and so what he had asked was, you know, can you relook at that now that we have the um, Measure E funds? Um, and it's not a, we don't need a, obviously we don't need a, a solution tonight, but I just wanted to throw that onto the list of things that we could evaluate to ensure that we have more ADA access um, in those shared parks. I believe that is our response, not the park's responsibility. It's not CSDs. The, the, the access points and the, and the uh, streets, uh, the sidewalks are our. Well, we have some shared responsibility with the district uh, regarding trail maintenance, uh, specifically as it relates <coughs> to ADA access. Those would typically be ours because we typically maintain the pavement as well as sure. the sidewalks. Um, be curious to know if the resident is asking specifically about access points or about ADA accessible facilities, because typically our trail facilities are ADA accessible, especially the new ones like the Camden Trail and, and the Laguna Creek Trail Spur that we built right. uh, that, that runs between CalFit right. there. And so uh, I'd be curious to know if it's more about access points where they have to walk a certain amount of distance in order to just get on the trail versus those ADA right. it, facilities. It, it is about the access points. It is about, you know, having, I mean, and it sounds, Sounds bad, but when, when you've got someone who's disabled or rehabilitating, it's difficult to walk them 
a half of a block to just to get to the trail, right? So um, that's what they're asking. Um, and if we could just take a look at that, evaluate it, and um, um, that was just their idea. So, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned the CSD. I have air quality tomorrow, STA coming up, SAC RT. So busy, busy bodies. So great to, great meeting. And um, I have no other report to offer. So we will go ahead and adjourn the meeting at 849. Have a great evening, everyone.